أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الله إن إسماسي has granted us additional days to be here once more at the Triple IT monthly seminar. So we thank Allah for that. Inshallah, we are going to start straight away. Uh, we apologize for the slight delay. This is due to human exigencies. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Shuaib, Mukhtar Shuaib, who is the Director of Research and Outreach, Department of Islamic Studies here in Bayer University, to give us an opening recitation of the Holy Quran. Dr. Shuaib. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما إنا عرض إن الأمانة على السماوات والأرض والجبال فأبين أن يحملناها فأبين أن يحملناها وأشفقن منها وحملها الإنسان إنه كان ظلوما جهولا ليعذب الله المنافقين والمنافقات والمشركين والمشركات ويتوب الله على المؤمنين والمؤمنات وكان الله غفورا رحيما صدق الله العظيم اللهم إنا نسألك بأسمائك الحسنى وصفاتك العلى وأنا نشهد أنك أنت الله لا إله إلا أنت الأحد الصمت الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد أن تجعل اجتماعنا هذا اجتماعا مرحوما مباركا واجعل تفرقنا بعده تفرقا معصوما ولا تجعل فينا ولا معنا شقيا ولا محروما برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين Thank you very much, Dr. Shaib, for that uh, beautiful recitation of the Holy Quran and the opening prayer. Thank you very much. Uh, let me again welcome everyone to this uh, 177th monthly seminar of the International Institute of Islamic Thought, Nigeria, holding at Bayer University, Kano. Faculty of Science Conference Room. I would like to just mention already the key, the speaker and the key persons on the high table have taken their seats, but nevertheless, I will seek the indulgence of the chairman to just mention their names. The chairman of this occasion is none other than Professor Muhammad Babangida Muhammad, Director of Center of Quranic Studies here at Bayer University. Is already seated. Is the first, is the second on the right, from my right. The speaker 
or the presenter of this seminar is none other than the national coordinator of the triple IT here in Nigeria, who is also a director center for Islamic civilization and interfaith dialogue, CICIT, Professor Salus Shehu. Inshallah, he's also the vice chancellor designate. I'm only saying designate because he's here with us. If he were there at his base, I dare not use that word designate. So he's the vice chancellor, inshallah, of Istikama University in Sumaila. The third person is Marlon Saidu Suleiman, who is a former director of publications at the IIIT and also a former lecturer at Saadu Trimi College of Education. So you are welcome. Dr. Salahuddin Yusuf has joined them. He's the Baba Adini of IIIT and also a former lecturer at FCE. So you are welcome. Dr. Jamilu Mustafa Chede is also with us. He's seated extreme left and he's from ATBU in Bauchi. I want to welcome all of you. I want to welcome the chairman and the speaker and uh, everybody else who has had time or sacrificed uh, some other engagements to be here. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the patience as well as the wisdom to actually listen to what is going to be presented and to actually benefit, perhaps even make uh, useful contributions that will enrich all of us. With that said, I want to hand over the microphone to the chairman who would now take over the proceedings. Prof, Prof. it's your turn. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brother Mustafa. Uh, I think you have simplified my uh, job uh, to introduce the speaker uh, and also those on the high table. You have already done that. Uh, the speaker doesn't need uh, introduction, really. Uh, so many times in these 177 uh, times we have met uh, in under the auspices of Triple IT, Professor Salis Shehu must have appeared uh, not less than 90 times or above. Uh, virtually uh, either as a chairman, a participant, a discussant, a presenter, uh, so many times. So he's uh, a common face in Triple IT monthly seminar. Uh, today, he's going to talk on the influence of Al Faruqi, Ismail Al Faruqi, on Islamic thought in the West region is going to take an analysis of the integration of knowledge literature here in Nigeria from the time of the establishment of the triple IT uh, here in Nigeria, particularly in the mid 80s, when uh, late Professor Mahdi was uh, appointed as the representative of the triple IT here in Nigeria coming to 1996 when Dr. Bashir Garadenchi came back from the United States of America and he established the Triple IT office here in Nigeria, here in BUK. And from that time, the activities of the Triple IT continued to uh, become exposed, not only here in BUK, but virtually in all higher institutions in Nigeria, the program of the triple IT, integration of knowledge, then it was the Islamization of knowledge, which developed into integration of knowledge. Uh, a lot of literature has been developed by local Nigerian uh, scholars who in their own rights 
have become international uh, scholars. I do not think anywhere outside where the triple IT was born, that is the United States of America and uh, Malaysia, where, uh, which served as the first laboratory, one would say, uh, in the actualization of the thoughts of the triple IT. I do not think there is any other place uh, where the ideas of the triple IT uh, have been uh, actualized, put into practice, uh, so much literature developed as uh, we have here in Nigeria. And uh, I think the, uh, we, we, we have to give credit to the due of Dr. Bashir Galadenti and Professor uh, Salisu uh, Shehu. May Allah bless their efforts. Talking about reform, uh, reform in uh, Islam is an integral part of the Islamic religion. And it takes so many different perspectives, reform in the spiritual uh, perspectives or in the political, social, economic, and we have the intellectual perspectives. The reform activity that has been uh, propounded, projected, developed, and promoted by the triple IT in our contemporary world is one of the most remarkable reform activities uh, which the Muslim world has uh, uh, witnessed. And Ismail al faruqi together with his colleagues, uh, Taha Jabir al Alwani, uh, Abu Suleiman, Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman, and Jamal uh, Berzenji. Uh, these people have actually uh, developed the idea of this integration of knowledge, which uh, was also uh, propounded and projected here in Nigeria. Our brother, Professor Salis Shehu, wants to analyze uh, so far the achievements, intellectual achievements in terms of the literature that has been developed here in Nigeria. And uh, he has been part and parcel of these uh, activities. Uh, I would give him uh, 40 minutes to present his paper, but uh, I would gladly also add for him uh, another uh, 10 to 15 minutes to make his uh, presentation. So, Professor Salih uh, over to you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fi. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man walahum bi ihsanin ila yomid din. Wa ba'd, the chairman of this session, our leader and amir, Professor Muhammad Babangida Muhammad, who is a I always I like history so much. Uh, he is the first Amir of the Muslim Forum of Bayer University, Kano. You may be aware of the Muslim Forum. So Professor Muhammad Babangida was the first Amir of the Muslim Forum here in Bayer University, Kano. And presently he is the Amir of the National Islamic Center or popularly known the Ummah. Our father and teacher and patron, Dr. Salpuddin Yusuf, who, has, who came across Islamization of knowledge, literature, and the writings of the people of the likes of al Faruqi years before we came across or we came into contact with those writings and literature. Malan Sayyid Suleiman, who 
uh, is a former director of the Triple IT, director of publications. We actually, you can say, started the Triple IT together with Malan Sayyid Suleiman, and he made very tremendous contributions to the establishment of the Triple IT office. A retired lecturer of economics with Saada Turimi College of Education. Uh, other directors of the Triple IT that are here, the MC himself, Mala Mustafa Chinede, and uh, Dr. Shu'at Uttar Shu'ayb, who recited the Quran for us. And uh, it's like I'm seeing Professor Aisha Garba Habib. And then other personalities that are here, like Dr. Jamilu Mustafa Chedi, who has been a prominent supporter of the Triple IT. Although he is a lecturer in ATBU, but there is hardly any activity of the Triple IT that would take place without him being present. We appreciate his support, actually. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Let me give a quick background to the paper before I start presenting it. Actually, this paper was written about five years ago. That was in 2016. And that was when the triple IT office in India organized what I think is 30 year anniversary. I think like 1986 or 2016 is 30 years, isn't it? Is it or 20 years? It's 30 years. The triple IT office in India, that is Institute of Objective Studies. It goes by the name Institute of Objective Studies, organized uh, an international conference or seminar on the life and times of Ismail Raji al faruqi to commemorate his 30 years of assassination. He was assassinated in 1986 in the United States of America. So 2016 was exactly 30 years after he was killed. So they invited for, you know, uh, papers to be written and I wrote but unfortunately, I was not able to go to India at that time to present the paper, I sent it. That is why, because I felt that the paper was being written for an international audience way, way far away from Nigeria, I felt there was the need to give the intellectual, a background of the intellectual history of West Africa. And that was why, that is what explains at the beginning of the paper, there is a lengthy uh, you know, presentation on the intellectual history of West Africa, number one. And number two, that is what explains the reason 1980 to 2015 was chosen. 1980 when, I mean, that is around the time when the triple I was, was established. Of course, it was established in 1981. So to that, uh, to 2015, that was a year before that conference, 2016, okay? That is it. And then because the paper was going to be presented in an international conference in the name of al Faruqi, and even the concept note of the conference contains some biography of al Faruqi. That was why the, I, I didn't think it was necessary to, to dedicate a section on the biography of Al Faruqi. But as I am going to present it now, I felt, especially for younger ones among us here, perhaps some of us that are here never heard of the name of Al Faruqi until when this paper uh, is going to be presented. So I felt it was necessary in this regard to, to, to create a section on the biography of Al Faruqi so that we don't just come and keep on talking about Al Faruqi, Al Faruqi, while the listeners don't actually know who that person was. So a section has been created in the edited version of the paper, which you don't have. But those of us that are on the high table, 
have that version of the paper, which contains uh, a section dedicated to the biography of Al Farugi. And because there are some historical facts, and there are very there is very vital information bordering on the intellectual history of West African subregion, I requested the chairman that rather than the usual pattern of presentation where we come and talk to the paper, I requested that I, I will read the paper verbatim, word for word, and I hope in the next 40 minutes as given to me, I will be able to, uh, you know, get to the end of the paper, inshallah wa ta'ala. I don't have to read the abstract because at the end of it, everything in the abstract is contained in the paper. So I begin. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. The integration of knowledge undertaken as conceived, developed, implemented, and promoted globally by the IIIT is one of the most spectacular reform initiatives in the Muslim world since the end of colonial domination. Uh, since the end of colonial domination, that Muslim world needs. Uh, to be stricken, uh, there is no need to repeat it. Since the end of colonial domination, this is not only because of its sustained and ever increasing global acceptance by Muslim scholars, intellectuals, and the general Muslim mass, but also because of the fact that it has proven to be an efficacious intellectual movement with sound homegrown mechanisms for analyzing Muslim challenges and propounding comprehensive and effective reform packages in the intellectual, cultural, economic, political, and social dimensions of Muslim lives. If intellectual domination, as Shehu 1998 argues, if intellectual domination is the most harmful and destructive aspect of colonial domination, being the most significant factor which ensures the perpetuation of political, economic, and cultural subjugation of the Muslim world by the West, then the integration of knowledge undertaken can well be argued to be the most important project that seeks to free the Muslim world from the shackles of perpetual Western imperialism. The Islamization of knowledge undertaken is the most integral part of the overall Islamic resurgence and movement. And without any doubt, without any doubt, al Faruqi was its foremost proclaimer, foremost torch bearer, its fountainhead, and its trailblazer. When the concept of Islamization of knowledge first emerged in the Nigerian academic and intellectual cycles, it was received with observable estrangement. People were not comfortable with the word Islamization of knowledge. There were a lot of challenges. Wherever we went and made presentation, people would ask the question, Islamization of knowledge, that it doesn't make, it didn't make sense to people, you know? People were, were, I mean, it was estranged and skepticism. It gradually, however, gained remarkable acceptance as manifested in the various Islamic oriented courses introduced in many faculties in Nigerian universities. I'm saying that the, the interaction of Islamic based courses is an evidence of gradual acceptance of the idea and concept of Islamization of knowledge. Islamic oriented primary and secondary schools have numerously been opened in all parts of the country. Schools like Darul Arkham and other schools, 30 years ago, they were not existing for young people like you because I know there are some audience I can see that Darul Arkham is older than them. Because whoever is 25 years old, I mean 30 years, Darul Arkham is older than him or her. So the opening of these kinds of schools, integrated schools are evidences. I mean, it's part of the evidence of the acceptance of the need to integrate knowledge. 
The number of academic degrees, target, and other forms of research is conducted and publications made on the Islamic perspectives of certain subjects or concepts can only be imagined. The main thrust of this paper was to examine the influence of al Farooqi on Islamic thought and intellectualism in West Africa, with particular reference to Nigeria, and again with particular reference to the uh, Islamization of knowledge movement. For this purpose, therefore, the paper first made a brief presentation on the history of Islam and Islamic learning and scholarship or Islamic education in a broader sense within the sub-region with special emphasis on Nigeria. This is immediately followed by a review of the influence of al Faruqi in the shaping and understanding of the core concept of Islamization of knowledge in Nigeria. A further exposition of the influence was made with reference to the Islamization of the disciplines or the specific areas of academic specializations. Recommendations and conclusion were made at the end of the paper. Now, first, in order to contextualize the paper, to situate the paper within a context, and the context here is the Islamic cultural and his, I mean, intellectual tradition, the history of Muslim intellectualism in this part of the world. So I say Islam and the history of learning in West Africa. From inception, the history of Islam is essentially a history of learning, knowledge, and scholarship. As the first revealed message in the Quran was the verse that commanded the Prophet وسلم, to reading. The Prophet understood this as a proclamation to the world that Islam is a religion of knowledge. The first, I mean, the West African sub-region represents one of the early abodes of Islam and invariably it was a hub of Islamic learning and scholarship. Based on the most reliable accounts, Islam West Africa as early as the century. Because of many factors, including importantly the deep-rooted presence of Islamic learning and various Islamic reform movements at important historic intervals, where West Africa has continued to be a stronghold of Islam as it remains the predominant religion in the region, with currently well over 70% of the West African sub-region being an adherents of the Islamic faith. The, re the region also established a strong educational link with the rest of the world through the exchange of students, scholars, and books as a means of extend expanding the frontiers of knowledge and promoting advanced researches in various fields of especially the Islamic sciences. As Bugaja 2015 notes, Various West African kingdoms and empires of West Africa, such as the Kingdom of Ghana, the Mali Empire, the Hausalan and the Kanembunu Empire, which were essentially Muslim states, fashioned very much along the Muslim states of North Africa, built a strong system of intellectual linkage and scholarly exchanges with the rest of the Muslim world by inviting and hosting great scholars such as Sheikh Abdul Karim Al Magili from Algeria, in addition to making contacts with scholars and saints during pilgrimage. As their leaders went for Hajj through Egypt, they used to bring back books and artisans. They also sent to, to various institutions of learning, such as Al Azhar where they even built hostels for their students and paid grants and only for the amended. When a battery came my father running down, cool. So you see, I, I'm saying here that some of the rulers of these kingdoms and empires, Islamic empires, used to even send students to Egypt. Borno Empire, which was 
essentially in its later history, an Islamic empire was sending students to Al-Azhar to the extent that Borno Empire established a sort of waqaf in Al-Azhar. That was to say it, it set up a sort of hostel in Al-Azhar, which is called Ruwak Al-Borno. Ruwak Al-Borno, that is Borno Hostel, which students from Borno Empire used to go and reside when they went for studies in Al-Azhar. When we are talking about this, we are talking about something in the region of 700 to 800 years ago. Don't think we are talking about 50 years or 100 years. We are talking about centuries before the birth of this country that is called Nigeria. Okay? With this, most West, West African countries, most most West African countries, such as Nigeria, Mali, Mauritania, and Senegal, among others, have throughout the, the greater part of their history, great centers of Islamic learning that can compete with any other centers in the rest of the Muslim world. The most prominent among these learning centers that was Timbuktu in Songhai as a established or affirmed by Suleiman 1980, 2010, which having hosted the University of Sankore, became famous as a city of scholars and a seat of learning, much like Azhar. The influence of Timbuktu on learning in West Africa became so pervading that the Timbuktu tradition became so prevalent in most parts of the region including Nigeria, Burkina Faso, and the rest, with clear similarities in terms of curriculum and teaching learn and learning methods. When we talk about the Timbuktu tradition, it needs to be understood what we have. This traditional Sangha in the traditional Sangha is essential. Not that in Timbuktu, but what I mean is that it is the Timbuktu tradition that when a child is taken to the Quranic school, the first thing is to get him to, to learn to read from Patiha and then to Alapta Rakaifa, and then come back and then read from, I mean, start Babbuku Alu Ambaiki Wozel in Hausa. In Kaluri, isn't it? It has it. In Fulfull Day, it has it. Are you following? Now, this pattern. He does the babagu to Alamta Kaifa and comes back and starts the parfaru from Fatia again to Alamta. And then comes back and begins the hajjatu and then off he goes, off to Bakara. This pattern, this tradition. Sub-region. By the 15th century, the city, that is Timbuktu, had already become the religious, scientific, and literary center of the Western Sudan. The Timbuktu phenomenon has been described by Malay Ibrahim Suleiman in the, his book, Revolution in History. He said, the city owed its prestige and its immense influence on the subsequent history of West Africa to its being a center of learning. It was a university complex, drawing students and scholars from different parts of the Muslim world. When Timbuktu is, was being, is being described in this form, Timbuktu, the Sankore University was there before the establishment of Oxford University and Cambridge. That is what people should know. That is why I was telling the chairman that because of this historical fact that I want younger people to know, I would please like to read the paper. Okay? So when we're talking of Sankore University in Timbuktu, we're not talking of, as I said earlier, 50 or 100 years ago. We're talking of something in the region of what I said from 500 years and above. Okay? So 
Brian Suleiman says, says it was a university complex, drawing students and scholars from different parts of the Muslim world, nourishing governments with administrators, clerks, and judges, feeding cities with imams, teachers, and jurists, and providing for the wider society a long chain of muftis, saints, and above all, mujaddids. The unusually high number of mujaddids which the Bilad Sudan has produced, perhaps higher than any other part of the Muslim world, can be attributed in part to the tradition of learning fostered by Timbuktu. This marriage between Islam and the spread of learning and scholarship presents itself so vividly in the history of Islam in West Africa, so much so that Shehu Tuten suggests a synonymity between the history of Islam and the history of Quranic schools in the West African subregion, as Islam was introduced concurrently with Quranic and general Islamic literacy. With this, the West African subregion became an abode of Islamic learning, scholarship, and intellectual engagement, you can say for nearly 1,000 years. Yes, for nearly 1,000 years. Islamic education and scholarship in Nigeria. Now, we spoke in the perspective of the entire West Africa. Now we are now zeroing down, narrowing down to Nigeria. Of all the West African nation states, and now I'm talking of nation states, but these nation states, the time we were talking about Timbuktu, these nation states were not existing. There was no Nigeria. There was no Ghana as we know it today. There was no Niger Republic because all these countries are not more than 100 years ago, just about 100 years ago. But the history we're talking about is a history, like I said to you, from 500 to 1,000 years ago, okay? But then we have to situate it within the concept of the nation, nation state so that you will understand it better. So I, I'm saying of all the West African nation states, Nigeria stands out on a vintage historical and sociological position. On the sociological plane, Nigeria has the greatest number of Muslim population within the West African subregion. Because, okay, although some countries in the region have near 100% Muslim population. If you take countries like Niger, has near 100% Muslim. Mali has near 100% Muslim. Senegal has near 100% Muslim. Gambia has near 100% Muslim. Mauritania has near 100% Muslim. But you see, of all, all these countries, whichever one you take, the Nigerian Muslim population is bigger than the entire Senegalese population. The Nigerian Muslim population is bigger than the entire Niger population. In fact, you can say, you may put Niger, Mali, Senegal, these are the biggest uh, after Nigeria, isn't it? Within the West, you may put them together, their entire population, both Muslim and non-Muslim in those countries. You may have to put them together before they can catch up with the Nigerian Muslim population. The Nigerian Muslim population stands at around 100 million people now. But then Niger, how many, what is the entire population of Niger? Just a little about 20 million, isn't it? Senegal and other places. So on the sociological plane, Nigeria enjoys a great deal of advantage than all these countries. Are you following? But although some countries in the region have near 100% Muslim population. You know, it's just like when you talk of Muslims in India as minority, isn't it? You talk of Muslims in India as minority, but the Muslims in India, the population of Muslims in India is bigger than entire population of Arab Muslims. But they are a minority in India. Because the Muslims in India are nearly about 400 million. But the entire Arab countries, putting, even when you put it together with North African countries, they're not more than 300 million. They're not even up to that. Because they are at Dwailat. Some of the countries, some of the Arab countries are not more than Tambata local government. 
<coughs> okay? Historically, we've, talking, we've, take, we've spoken about the sociological advantage that Nigerian Muslims have. Historically, the present day Northern Nigeria constitutes almost the entire radius. The present day Northern Nigeria almost constitutes the entire radius covered by the Sokoto Jihad movement. This movement did not only lead to the establishment of a caliphate as such, but it was also a comprehensive intellectual, cultural, and socio-political revival. This is the fact that explains the outstanding, the outstanding Islamic intellectual vibrancy in the country ahead of all others in the sub-region. I say, high intellectual vibrancy in Nigeria. Muslim intellectualism and scholarship in Nigeria cannot be compared with any country in the West African sub-region. There are more scholars of international repute today in Nigeria, Muslim scholars, that you don't find in any of the West African countries. In any of the West African countries. With this remarkable historical antecedents, the Islamic intellectual and cultural reawakening that started around the beginning of the second half of the 20th century and which reached its highest momentum in the 1970s and 1980s naturally found in Nigeria not just a fertile ground, but also certain ready-made ready -made intellectual structures and icons or torchbearers that upheld, proclaimed, promoted, and further propounded and expounded its essential mission, inspiration, and aspirations. It is clear from the above discussion that Timbuktu had produced an effective Islamic education model for the entire Muslim communities in West Africa. This makes it that the history of learning in Nigeria is similar to the one described above. Like the rest of West Africa, Islam came to Nigeria together with a viral system of Islamic learning and scholarship. It is on, on record. It is on record. I'm sorry to just digress a little. I've been talking about the Timbuktu tradition, but the Timbuktu tradition in, in terms of Quranic learning, especially, the Timbuktu tradition is more strictly and essentially more prominent as far as Quranic Makarata Allah is concerned. The Timbuktu tradition is more prominent in uh, in what you call uh, the former Sokoto Caliphate. That is minus Borno, because the traditions have some little difference, not in terms of the beginning, but at the end of it, you see the Borno tradition I mean, emphasizes Hadda memorization, while the what you can call the Senegambian tradition the Senegambian tradition, what do we have in this part of the, of, the, of, the, of the north? Emphasizes, you see, learning the meaning of the Quran, learning rather than memorization. This, are, this is the only <coughs> difference. It is clear, um, it is on record, the different parts of what is called Nigeria today had been the bastion of knowledge for over a millennium where seekers of knowledge used to frequent. In the Hausa land, for example, Katsina grew so strategically as a global center of learning, even before the establishment of the Sokoto Caliphate in the 19th century. Katsina housed many centers of learning, such as Endoto and Ranko, which became famous throughout Northern Nigeria and the West African subregion in addition to the more important Gobarau Mosque in Katsina City, which was among the oldest universities in pre-colonial Africa that compared with the rest of Black African medieval universities, such as Fez and Timbuktu. For this, Katsina was able to attract renowned scholars and jurists such as al Magili, who was said to have been taken the teaching profession there as well as also serving as a judge. You know, al Magili stayed in Katsina for several years before he moved down to Kano and stayed with, I mean, uh, Muhammad Urumfa and uh, to write the Tajil Muluk, isn't it? And so on and so forth. 
building on the long established scholarship as epitomized by Timbuktu tradition, as well as the legacies of the Kenan Bono and Kazuna scholarship, the founding fathers of the Sokoto Caliphate also established an unparalleled culture of multidisciplinary learning and scholarship that even with the unrepentant onslaught of the European colonialism and their deliberate attempt at destroying it, it has continued the tradition, the intellectual scholarship and tradition established by the Sokoto triumvirate has continued to be strong and relevant till date, especially in Northern Nigeria. Interestingly, starting from the Timbuktu tradition up to the other institutions that were built on its basis, such as the Sokoto Caliphate, the general tradition of learning in West Africa did not confine knowledge onto the so-called on, only to the so-called religious sciences, nor did it dichotomize between what might be perceived as religious sciences and what may be regarded as secular sciences. Hence, at the time when the Quran, Sunnah, and Islamic jurisprudence were receiving attention as core courses in the Timbuktu curriculum, so also were other sciences such as medicine, agriculture, and so on. As argued by the famous Senegalese historian, Sheikh Anta Diop, several centuries before colonialism, Aristotelian logic was being widely studied by local African scholars in places like Timbuktu. Anta Diop states that 14 centuries before Levi Brohl wrote his primitive mentality, also known by the title How Natives Think, Black Muslim Africa was commenting on Aristotle's formal logic and was devoted to dialectics. In the Sokoto tradition also, knowledge was regarded as a universal human legacy, a value-laden endeavor, and a purpose-driven sociocultural institution. As the late Waziri of Sokoto, Junaid bin Buhari, who was one of the greatest scholars produced by the Sokoto tradition, argues in line with the philosophy of the Sokoto Caliphate. He said, knowledge is certainly universal and timeless but it has a social cultural stamp. It also has a purpose and a commitment to a particular worldview. It cannot therefore be neutral. It was this broad view of knowledge that made the Sokoto Jihad leaders the most multidisciplinary scholars that they were. Hence, over 300, the over 300 books, and I'm just being modest I'm by saying 300, but if you are to put the writings, the writings of Sheikh, Muhammad, uh, Sheikh uh, Usman Danfodio, Sheikh Abdullah Ngondu, and the Sultan Muhammad Bello, if you are to put together all their writings, they may be around 500 or more. So I'm saying, hence, of the over 300 books authored by the triumvirate, the three are called triumvirates of Sheikh Usman bin Fodio, Sheikh Abdullahi bin Fodio, and Sheikh Muhammad, Sultan Mohammed Bello, many titles focus on politics. I mean, they were not writing on Hadith only. They were not writing on Quran, Tafsir only. Are you following? But they were writing on all other fields because there was no dichotomization in the intellectual tradition. So hence you will see among their writings, you will see some of their titles focus on politics, and statecraft and administration. Some writings are on medicine. For example, so Sultan Muhammad Bello wrote on, on Basil, okay? He wrote on hemorrhage, how to cure it, and so on and so forth. Abdullah Ilan Fodio wrote on architecture and town planning. There is a book dedicated to him on town planning and I mean urban planning on how to construct cities so that there will be ventilation in the cities. It is not by accident that in all over Northern Nigeria in the former Sokoto Caliphate, all over Northern Nigeria, the pattern of town setting is, all, is the same. It's not by accident. Wherever you go in all the emirates of the Sokoto Caliphate, you will find the house of the Emir and the, the most is directly in front of the Emir, uh, Emir's house. Then there is Kotu, isn't it? the site, then there is a prison, and then there is market. All over, you go all around, it's always like that. It's not by accident. 
So they were not just on, I mean, focusing on tafsir and hadith and so on. They were well versed in those, but they were also writing on other fields. Astronomy, history, and other disciplines that may be regarded as secular sciences. <laughs> okay, such was the situation of learning and scholarship in pre-colonial West Africa and Nigeria. Sadly, colonialism as an aggressive onslaught for socio-cultural socio and political-economic exploitation came and changed things upside down. It relegated Islamic learning to the background and imposed on the Muslims Western amoral cultural values, economic system, and political philosophy, in addition to planting a secular educational system that would continue to sustain their social cultural subjugation through intellectual enslavement. All this was to reduce Muslims to mere consumers, promoters, and servants of a system that is not only alien and antithetical to them, but actually subversive to the essence of their civilization and worldview. By the time the colonials le left, most of the Muslim communities in West Africa, like the rest of the Muslim world, was in intellectual confusion and cultural bondage, having been caged in educational duality with their traditional Islamic system that was sidelined while they impose alien system, the Western system that enjoys unparalleled official patronage was privileging. But as it were, Muslims, especially after colonialism, continued to nurture their anti-secular concerns and the need to bring back education to its rightful position. That is that which is rooted in the Islamic belief system imbued with Islamic moral values. This is the historical fact that informed the Islamization of knowledge undertaking to which Al Faruqi happened to be one of its foremost proponents and exponents. And this is what explains why, when the Islamization of knowledge was brought, it was accepted easily by many Muslim scholars. Now, the early life of uh, Al Faruqi. Al Faruqi, we have been talking about Al Faruqi. Who is this Al Faruqi? Al Faruqi was born in Jaffa, Palestine. So he's a Palestinian. He's an Arab Palestinian. On January 1st, 1921, and grew up in a prosperous and scholarly family. Um, I don't have to read the entire page. You will uh, have it. Uh, when, we, when we reproduce the edited version of the paper. But then I need to say that you see, he's one of the uh, prominent intellectual Muslims in the late 20th century, or in the last half of the 20, uh, in the second half of the 20th century, as he was born in 1921. He had his education in the American University in Beirut. <laughs> then he went to America and had his education variously in Indiana and in Harvard. So he's a Harvard scholar. As they, uh, you know, as they talk about it today, and uh, he had a lot of intellectual debuts and intellectual adventures. You will read all that. The most important thing is that he was one of the founding members or founding fathers of the Triple IT. First, find uh, establishing the Association of Muslim Social Scientists in West uh, in in America and then later the establishment of the, uh, the triple IT. And uh, the, 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 the concept or the term Islamization of knowledge is being attributed to him. It's being attributed to him. Although there are some arguments that uh, Sheikh, uh, Muhammad al attas al-Naqib, uh, Najib Muhammad al attas al-Naqib uh, of Malaysia is the one that was claimed to be the first person to coin 
the term Islamization of knowledge, whatever the case may be, I, I think uh, Ismail Raja al Faruqi is prominently identified as the forerunners of the Islamization of knowledge undertaking. He was so, he was a very prominent intellectual, very influential intellectual from the 1970s, or you can say from the 1960s to the time he was killed in America. He was a strong anti-Zionist, a strong anti-Zionist. And in fact, you see like many intellectuals, you can say that Ismail Raja al faruqi went through a number of intellectual sojourns. He went through a number of intellectual transformation because he was, he was, there is a writing on him, which is titled is Ismail Raji al faruqi from Arabism to Islamism. Because he was earlier, you know, a, a stuck into this Uruba. In fact, there are, there are a lot of his writings on Uruba. And it was said that sometimes, was it when he was sick, he confided in one of the very prominent uh, triple IT intellectuals, Elias Bayunus, who is a sociologist and a non-Arab, that he told him that, you see, I used to be a Palestinian, an Arab, and a Muslim in that order. That he used to think himself first as a Palestinian, and then an Arab, then a Muslim. But he said, but I am now a Muslim, an Arab, and a Palestinian. Are you following? He transformed. And he became so strong, the strongest anti-Zionist intellectual. And not surprisingly, he was assassinated in the month of Ramadan in his house in Pennsylvania, in the United States. Somebody went into their house, I think with a knife, who? And he stabbed him and his wife, Lamia al Faruqi, and killed the two of them. Uh, may Allah accept them as shuhada. Oh. Now, somewhere there, we have presented uh, some of his writings and so on and so forth. I think uh, those of us that have the paper will read so much about Al Faruqi. Now, Islamization of knowledge and the influence of Al Faruqi on Nigeria or in Nigeria. The Islamization of knowledge drive started in Nigeria as early as in the mid 1980s with the appointment of the late Professor Mahdi Adamu as the representative of the Triple IT in Nigeria. Professor Mahdi Adamu was then the vice chancellor of the University of Sokoto. <coughs> University of Sokoto, for those of you that are young, is the one that is now called uh, Usman Danfodio University. It used to be called University of Sokoto. The undertaking took off with a strong drive and with a formidable administrative support and patronage. Very spectacular steps were taken to ensure remarkable institutionalization of the undertaking that is of the Islamization of under, uh, knowledge undertaking in the university. These include the introduction of Islamic based courses in various departments of the humanities and the social sciences and recruitment of several tens of academic staff and sending them immediately for postgraduate studies. That was around 1986, 87 and 88. Komaik adara adara fataku. There was Professor Abdurashid Morton, then Dr. Abdurashid Morton, a, an Indian uh, lecturer here in the Department of Political Science, uh, who was associated with the Triple IT since when he was here. And today he is, for about 30 years now since he left Nigeria, he is still in International Islamic University, Malaysia. He was the one that was working together with uh, with. Uh, with uh, Professor Madi Adamu, especially, you know, uh, getting lecturers here, I mean, students, graduating students here, and sending them to Madi Adamu to be employed. That was how some of our brothers that graduated from Buki here, uh, like Dutzim and others, got recruited into Usman Namfodi University. 
that time we were in the NYSC. Uh, I didn't know that something like that was happening. And then we met with Rashid Morton in the Islam in Africa conference in, in, in Abuja. And by that time he had sent many brothers to Usman Danfuda and were recruited. He said, ah, where are you? I've been looking for you at that time because what I Tawazi. University about University. Alhamdulillah. So they were recruiting to lecturers. If you finish in sociology, you would be recruited to Usman Danfodi University, and you will be sent to either Malaysia or Pakistan, Islamabad, to go and read Islamic studies. If you have a degree in sociology, you will be sent to go and read masters in Islamic studies so that you have sufficient knowledge of Islam and see how you can transform your sociology to Islamic sociology. If you graduated in Islamic studies like uh, Abdul Zimma, he graduated with Islamic studies here and he was sent, I think, to go and read either political science or whatever. You understand? So many professors now that are in Usman Nafodi University, professors of sociology, professors of political science that I know were originally graduates of uh, Islamic studies. They were sent through the Islamization of Knowledge program. Are you following? And then there are some who are PhDs now and professors in Islamic studies, but were initially graduates of uh, some disciplines. Or oh, especially in the economics, some of them were even sent to Jeddah and to Malaysia to go and read masters in Islamic economics like our professor Chika and others, many of them. So that was the movement when Mahdi Adamu was the vice chancellor, okay? So I said, this included the introduction of Islamic-based courses in various departments of the humanities and social sciences and recruitment of several tens of academic staff and sending them immediately for postgraduate studies. With the establishment of the Nigeria Office of the Triple IT in Kano, after the return of uh, Dr. Bashir Garadan, she was appointed uh, from United States. The movement took a new turn and it took a new drive that saw its propagation and introduction to many, many universities, polytechnics, and colleges of education through various forms of outreach programs. You see, what Mahdi Adamu, as the vice chancellor, as a vice chancellor, was doing, what was only trying to institutionalize the Islamization of knowledge within the university. He was only recruiting staff and he was only introducing courses in departments. But it was when Dr. Bashir Galadenchi came and we, we established the triple IT office here in Bayero University, Kano, then we started reaching out. We started reaching out and going to many universities and colleges and polytechnics, propagating the Islamization of knowledge, presenting papers. Uh, Manas Eidu Suleiman is here, he would remember how we travel with him to Lagos, to Ibadan and other places, making presentations in Lasu, Unilag. We even went to University of Benin, uh, Federal College of Education, Okene, many places outside Kano, not to talk of going to Sokoto, Meduguri several times, presenting papers of, and this is how the idea is of Islamization of knowledge was promoted and spread into various institutions. But at the time of Madi Adamu, it was confined within Usman Amfodio University. The Islamization of knowledge undertaking received a rapid boost in Nigeria due to many factors. One important factor is perhaps the fact that Muslim intellectuals saw it as a viable vehicle for the continuation of the struggle to revive the golden legacies of the Sokoto Caliphate which were largely truncated by the deliberate policies of the colonial invaders. As demonstrated earlier, <coughs> excuse me, the Sokoto Caliphate had built a sound educational edifice rooted in the cultural values and aspiration of the Muslims. And so Muslims remain largely disillusioned with the, with the replacement of the Islamic system with a Western secular educational system, as they were remembering those pre-colonial days with nostalgia and aspiring to revive them. It was natural, therefore, 
that the Islamization of knowledge as an intellectual endeavor geared towards reforming Muslim thought, reviving Muslim educational legacy, and recasting knowledge to ensure its conformity with the Islamic values of Tawhid and Khilafah could easily be accommodated by the Muslim intellectuals. The Islamization of Knowledge Project therefore made a great appeal to the conscience of intellectuals in the country and was revived with great, was received with great enthusiasm. Given that a dedicated office with dedicated staff and enthusiastic directors was already uh, for was ready for promoting the philosophy and ideals of Islamization of knowledge, no sooner than the triple IT office was established, a series of intellectual activities started. The office introduced the monthly group discussions where scholars, lecturers, and researchers from different higher institutions meet to present and discuss well research papers covering various aspects of Islamization and the Islamic sciences. This tradition, this tradition which has been sustained for the present, to the present moment, 25 years now, in your papers, you will see 23 years, I mean, 22 years, 25 years now, from 1996 to the present day is 25 years. The first um, seminar was uh, presented in the former faculty of law by Professor Mewada, uh, Professor Ali Udoda, and my humble self, under the old spices of the Muslim Forum. And at that time, Professor Malam Babangida was the, was the Amir of the Muslim Forum at that time. In fact, this particular forum where you are, it started as a collaboration between Triple IT and Muslim Forum. And earlier, we were doing it in collaborative form. It used to be monthly group discussion of Muslim Forum and Triple IT. But over time, the Muslim Forum was lagging behind. So the Triple IT just took the gauntlet and continued. Okay. So a vast number of scholars to the concept of philosophical, to the concepts philosophical and epistemological foundation and methodologies of the Islamization knowledge, as well as the crisis of Muslim education and the imperative of educational reform based on the Tawhidi epistemology as propounded and encapsulated in the Islamization knowledge project. Within a short period, the founding fathers of the triple IT, such as Islam, Ismail Farooqi, Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman, Taha Jabir al Alwani, Mona Abu Fadl, among others, started to become household names among a host of Muslim academics and students in Nigerian higher institutions with the influx of the Islamization knowledge in literature from the triple IT head office and other offices around the world, and the subsequent outreach efforts of the Nigeria Office of the Triple IT. Among all those names mentioned above, it is only Abu Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman that is surviving. All the rest have died, Rahimahumullah. And one interesting story about Mona. Mona Abu Fadal was, a, was an Egyptian professor of, I think, uh, sociology. She was, she's a lady. If you write, if you take her papers to read, you may have to be reading every sentence twice before you, you capture what she, what she, what the message she wants to, 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 to put across. One, 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 one of the, her titles is Cultural Paradization and Paradization of Cultures. Dr. Bashir was saying that even in America, when they have triple IT or a social Muslim social scientist presentation, when Mona Abu Fadl comes, I mean, came to make presentation, even in America, many people would, would, would go out hissing and say, Subas again, I'm gonna take care for that. <laughs> she's she's a, a real intellectual colossus. And her, her papers are and writings are, are highly, highly intellectual. I remember one title of her book, Squiring the Cycle in Middle Eastern Studies. Squiring the cycle in Middle Eastern studies, the aesthetics of a political inquiry. Mm. Eh? Yeah. Eh. You know cycle and you know square, isn't it? So squiring the cycle. <laughs> oh. 
Okay. The triple IT Nigeria office and the promotion of the name and thoughts of Al Faruqi. The triple IT office, what has it done to promote the name of Al Faruqi? The Nigeria office of the triple IT took some deliberate steps at popularizing the works of prominent scholars and protagonists of the integration of knowledge undertaken. As it were, Al Faruqi stands in the front. First, it developed a distribution list of its books, a list of which comprises of the names of scholars and intellectuals, as well as libraries across the country. Secondly, the office established the monthly group discussion, became a strategic place for recruiting new friends for the triple IT, and also updating participants with latest publications and general global developments in the Islamization of knowledge drive. Thirdly, the office established its library where triple IT publications and other valuable works on different aspects of Islamic thought and Islamization are stopped. At different points, the office reprinted and distributed thousands of copies of a number of imported Islamization of knowledge publications due to the rising demands for them. This also led to another important strategic step, which was the establishment of the Ismail Raji Al Faruqi bookshop. And I want to, I want to specially recognize and put on record the role played by Malan Saeedu Suleiman in the establishment of this library uh, bookshop, Ismail Raji Al Faruqi bookshop. We 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 establish it first. Malan Saeedu Suleiman was the one that surveyed for us what strategic place can we get. We want to get we wanted to get a strategic place in Kano where to establish the bookshop not within the university. And uh, he was the one that identified for us one of the shops on Zaria Road. On, on Zurod or Zaria Road, just Zaria Road by Dengi or whatever, around Dengi, but yes, uh, that exists. We established the Ismail Raji Al Faruqi uh, bookshop. That is the first time people in Kano would be, would be coming across the name of Al Faruqi. They, you, as you are passing, you will see the notice uh, signboard. Al Faruqi bookshop, Al Faruqi bookshop. But because of our own poor culture of reading in, in Northern Nigeria, unfortunately, the bookshop was not being patronized. And especially because the books that we put there are books of triple IT that are highly intellectual. I mean, very likely a person will enter the bookshop and will read all the titles. He may not capture the sense from the titles. Are you following? So people were not patronizing. We had to close it and we had to bring it into the, into the university campus. This container that you see by the mosque, this metal container that you see by the mosque, it was originally the, the Al Faruqi bookshop. When we brought it into the campus and we had to get some place to put it, we bought this container we, we, we renovated it and reconstructed it, and then we put Al Faruqi bookshop there. But even here, this book, you see, if you want a bookshop to survive, you say, like, so writing books in the even so July, you know, that are like for primary school children, the so on. Otherwise, if it is a highly intellectual bookshop, people hardly patronize it. The bookshop has died. This particular gesture promoted in no small measure the name, person, and thoughts of Al Faruqi in Nigeria. Many customers kept asking the question, who is this Al Faruqi? In most cases, after explaining who the person was, we usually encourage the listener to buy one of the available books authored by or edited by Al Faruqi. Or as the case may be, the person would get excited and would ask about how he or she would know more about the man and his ideas. In that way, as a result of the naming of the bookstore after him, his name and ideas kept spreading within the cycles of Muslim intellectuals and scholars, as well as da'wah workers and Islamic activists in Nigeria. It is important to state that a lot of the presentations made at the earlier days of the Triple IT group discussion, this particular group discussion, centered around a review of the publications of the pioneer scholars of the Triple IT, such as Al Faruqi himself. What I'm saying here is that the way we started this uh, group discussion, at the time we started, at the time we started, and as I was saying, 
We started when Professor Wabengina was the Amir of the Muslim Forum. At the time we started the triple IT and this group discussion, it was only Professor Mewada and Dr. Bashir that were PhD holders at that time. And I think uh, Dr. Salahuddin Yusuf, all of us were Man and Salis Shehu, Man and Babangida, Man. So you see, we were, I was a graduate assistant at that time, or an assistant lecturer at that time. So you see, some of us were struggling to finish their master's, some of us were struggling to finish their PhD. It was difficult to sit down and write papers. So what we were doing was to pick up a paper written by Al Faruqi, presented there on Islamization. We come and present it and we discuss it. That was how we started. We would pick a paper written by Taha Jabir Al Alwani or imagine these frontliners, these forerunners of the Islamization of knowledge. That was how we started. Are you following? Before we began to write papers on our own. So in that way, there were several presentations made on papers written by Al Faruqi. So that kept on making the name to be ringing continuously. The influence of Al Faruqi's thought in Nigeria. Here, uh, I just made an overview of how Al Faruqi was uh, being frequently referred to in the Islamization of knowledge literature. One of the things that is apparently clear in the Islamization of knowledge literature, especially in Nigeria, is the preponderance of the influence of Al Faruqi. It is palpable through references to Al Faruqi's monumental works. It is against this backdrop that Adeba, your 2008 notes, he says, just as Albert Einstein achieved popularity for his theory of relativity, with which he revolutionized the study of the, in the physical sciences, the theory of the modern Islamization of knowledge will remain incomplete if the name of Al Faruqi is omitted. The Islamization of knowledge program in Nigeria is championed by the Nigeria office in Kano. The Institute has created the much needed awareness of the Islamization of knowledge undertaking, thereby stimulating and sparring interest in the area. Among the Islamization of knowledge strategies the IIIT adopts included conducting and publishing researches, organizing outreach programs, holding monthly group discussion, hosting conferences, workshops, seminars, manpower development, among others. The Triple IT Nigeria office publishes literature on the IK. A careful study of the literature by various scholars across the country shows that there was a great deal of referencing to Al Faruqi's ideas and thoughts throughout. An attempt has been made in the next sections of this paper to demonstrate how several scholars often refer to Al Faruqi, both in their writings on Islamization of knowledge and other aspects of Islamic thought the influence of Al Faruqi on Islamization knowledge and uh, foundation literature. In the first instance, it is pertinent to examine the influence of Al Faruqi on the core concept of Islamization knowledge. The pioneer publication of the triple ITN on Islamization knowledge can be seen as an exposition on Al Faruqi's treatise on Islamization knowledge. Shehu 1998 wrote Islamization knowledge, conceptual background, vision and tasks. Mewada wrote Islamization of knowledge, historical background, and recent development. Suleiman, Malan Sayyidu Suleiman here, wrote on Islamization of knowledge, background models, and the way forward. Bashir Galadan, she edited the book on Islamization of knowledge, a research guide, which was a compilation of articles that serve as foundation and compass for conducting Islamization of knowledge related researches. All this, if you take them together, this was actually the fourth work published by the Nigerian office. But what is instructive here is that all these authors that have been mentioned were primarily inspired by Al Faruqi. All of them did not only make mere reference to Al Faruqi, but they significantly relied on his ideas and thoughts to explain the concept of Islamization of knowledge. May what for example, mentioned above, can actually be described as a sort of summary, his work. His title, if you look at his title, Mayweather's title, Islamization of Knowledge, Historical Background and Recent Development. If you look at it, it was just, it was actually, it can be described as a sort of summary of Al Faruqi's book on Islamization, which is titled 
Islamization of knowledge, general principles, and work plan. While in the work plan, in the work plan, Al Faruqi presented a 12 step agenda for prosecuting the Islamization of knowledge undertaking. Mayweather 1999 argued that some of the steps, some of the 12 steps suggested by Al Faruqi can be merged into one. And in that regard, he presented a six step agenda, which was just imagine the 12th agenda of Al Faruqi. And then in a related development, Galadanchi, the Islamization of knowledge undertaken and contemporary Nigerian educational system, the Islamization of knowledge, historical background are among the literature in, uh, in the category we have, talking, we have spoken about. Then in the next uh, section, we have spoken about the influence of Al Faruqi generally on certain specialized areas of study. And especially in the social sciences, I have taken much time. I don't need to read everything in this section uh, vibrating. Uh, we can go through. And I think we have special, special uh, 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 elaborately talk, I mean, uh, spoken on the influence of Al Faruqi. Uh, so I will just uh, take us through the recommendation. There is no doubt that Al Faruqi was a great mind. His vision for the Ummah was certainly insightful and also ambitious. His ideas and thoughts are still alive and are therefore very universal. They are indeed still significant in Muslim intellectual endeavors. In a general sense, therefore, it is recommended that all efforts must be done to make Al Farouk's dream real. How? By asserting the relevance of his ideas and thoughts to our own time and circumstances and even beyond. Conferences like this particular one and other forms of initiatives like those of the Nigeria Office of the Triple IT should also be done repeatedly in order to immortalize the name and thoughts of Al Farugi. This paper essentially tried to expound the influence of Al Farugi in West Africa. However, bearing in mind the fact that it was meant to be presented in far away Asia, in India in particular, it was felt that it was pertinent to give a geographical and historical context of it. Hence, the paper first made a brief presentation on the history of Islam and Islamic learning and scholarship or Islamic education in a broader sense within the subregion, with special emphasis on Nigeria. This is immediately followed by a review of the influence of Al Faruqi in shaping an understanding of the core concept of Islamization of knowledge in Nigeria. A further exposition of such influence was made with reference to the Islamization of the disciplines or the specific areas of academic specializations. It is hoped that the presentation made here would be a source of inspiration to young academics as well as scholars in the Muslim world, so that we will double up in our efforts at salvaging the Ummah from its state of apathy and all round seemingly, unfortunately, seemingly irredeemable backwardness. May Allah forgive Professor Ismail Raji Al Farugi. May he accept him as a matiya. May he reward him for all the good works he did in the course of Islam and the Muslim world. We have not gone through the titles, but one book I will recommend to all of us is the book written by Al Faruqi, Al Tawheed, its implication in thought and life. Al Faruq, Al Tawheed, its implication in thought and life. It's a very, very important book that will help you to understand actually the concept of Tawheed and how Tawheed runs through everything that a Muslim does, including the way you, you think and the way you look at knowledge and so on and so forth, and any, many other things. Uh, Uh, I didn't want 
him to actually even finish, even though I had given him uh, time to finish, but the presentation is actually in depth and uh, it has given us a very good insight into the Islamization of knowledge program as a whole in the world and its impact here in Nigeria. I may not necessarily need to give a summary of what he has uh, discussed, but uh, I have noted some five, six important uh, points, which I think we need to recap them. Uh, one is that the integration of knowledge program is the most important project which seeks to free the Muslim world from the shackles of submission, subjugation to Western thoughts, Western ideas, Western ideology. This is very important for us to realize that uh, if people are defeated intellectually, that is the end of uh, that society or these people. And what we need in the Muslim world today is to have to build our own ideas, our own intellectual ideas, not being subservient to the West. And this is very, very important. Uh, secondly, that Ismail al faruqi was the foremost and most important forerunner in the Islamization of knowledge or integration of knowledge uh, program. In the beginning of the program, uh, generally and specifically here in Nigeria, it was received with mixed feelings. It was not well understood. And I think up to today, there are quite a number of people, even within the academics, uh, who do not really understand what the Islamization of knowledge is all about. And even when you talk of integration of knowledge, they are still not at home with actually uh, the whole notion, the whole idea of the Islamization of knowledge program, because probably they have not read uh, about it, even though there are thousands of materials uh, Professor has mentioned that is available, but people really don't care to read, most especially uh, books that do not belong to their own uh, areas of specialization. People, because of this uh, issue of specialization, people restrict themselves to part their particular area. They don't read outside their area of specialization, even within the academics. You find a professor who specializes, who specializes in his own area, you find him nearly at zero level in other fields. But what is important for uh, an intellectual is that you take little bits from here, you have some little information. If you specialize in biology, at least you should have some little knowledge, no matter how little, in history, in geography, in physics, in mathematics, in philosophy, in this and that area, to have some little knowledge about it. Uh, if you are asked, if you are a professor of uh, biochemistry or any other field, and you are asked about the seven rivers, the biggest rivers in Africa, and you don't know them. I, ah, this is, these are things even at primary level, we, we memorize them, uh, you, you, you know them. Uh, but you find now, sometimes even people who are specialized in geography, who to tell you about the in Africa, in Niger, Central, Orange, Zambezi. We memorize this in primary school. Uh, so there is this need for us to read these materials that are being developed by the and give us a brief history about uh, on Islamic uh, Please, uh, can you send this one? Islamic education in Africa, in West Africa, and specifically in Nigeria. He talked about 
with Sankore University. <laughs> the University of Sankore was established in the year 989. It was the third university established in the world. The first university, the University of Karawin, then followed by Al Azhar, and then thirdly, it was the Sankore University, which interestingly was built by a Muslim lady, a Mandinkan lady. She was the one who built the mosque, and it developed into uh, a university after that. As of now, it has been registered over 70,000 manuscripts of were written by scholars of uh, the Sankore University. And mind you, it was not only Islamic studies, Greek, Hadith, the other uh, were taught. They were taught, uh, they were taught astronomy, medicine, math, physics, philosophy, language, so many fields of uh, Islamic knowledge. He also talked about the main thing, the introduction of the IEK project in Nigeria in the 80s, uh, where a deliberate effort were made, particularly by the late Abu Mahdi Adam, developing young academics, particularly in the project. You didn't care about the battery, did you? Yes, sir. Why the failure? I'm going to call you a hacker. I'm going to call you a hacker. Yes, okay. Hacker. 1996 to 2021, uh, when Shir Galadenchi took over and established the triple IT office here in Kano. He mentioned quite a number of activities that the triple IT conducted. I think it is worth suggesting that someone should document all these efforts that have been made, particularly from 1996. I think this uh, represents a new uh, what one would say, a new readjustment uh, revolution within the project in Nigeria. 25 years from 1996 to 2021, someone needs to write uh, for us about the Islamization of Knowledge Program or the establishment of the triple IT uh, in Nigeria from 1996 to 2021, so that uh, we would be able to document all the efforts that have been made, all the programs that have been developed, all these uh, seminars that we have been holding, what has been produced, the many journeys that uh, people have undertaken to various universities, various polytechnics, various colleges of education, institutions of higher learning. Let us document uh, these uh, for the future generation. And I think also from the problems that have been mentioned by Professor Salis Shehu, I think uh, we need to have someone to write uh, a simplified uh, booklet about the whole concept of the Islamization or the integration of knowledge uh, program for the uh, readership of our uh, young uh, sons and daughters in secondary schools and probably even at the uh, undergraduate level. So far, the efforts that have been made, uh, the writings of Professor Sarishio, the writings of uh, Dr. Bashir Galadanchi, uh, Professor Danjuma Mewada, Professor Ali Dauda, and the others, uh, they have simplified it somehow these uh, are uh, the, the, the ideas, but uh, they are still more understandable to 
uh, people at the higher level, uh, postgraduate to the higher level. Probably we need to write a very simplified, in a very simplified form for the benefit of uh, those who are coming up so that we start to uh, build them right from the beginning. When they develop, uh, they will be able to uh, live up to the expectation. Uh, we thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. And I think uh, it is time now for us to give chance for our brothers and sisters here uh, to make commentaries. Uh, do I have to point out? Or I expect uh, our Baba Adini to start, set the ball rolling uh, because he's the Baba Adini. So we cannot uh, jump him. Okay, sir. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي My name is Salahuddin Yusuf formerly of FCE Kano Um Mr Chairman like you have just done I wish also to congratulate Professor Salih Sushehu for this rich and thought provoking presentation. What I want to add to Professor Salis Shehu's presentation is that Al Faruqi instilled confidence, faith, certainty in us with his writings. And you have equally done that this afternoon with your presentation by going through what you have written you have rekindled our memory. You have, you have reminded us of our past glory, our past history, and what has been done during the Brno and Sokoto Halifate. All this effort put together has changed, should change our mindset, should change our mindset about ourselves, about who we are and about our past. Spoken to us about Borno contribution, you have spoken to us about Sokoto Halifit. What they have contributed is actually like a foundation for Islamization of knowledge. If you look at what the jihadists wrote, you observe that they, they approach all their writings from the perspective of a Tawheed. Let me make a little reference to Infakul Mesur. You observe that Muhammad Bello decided to write about history of the jihad, but he ended up writing about so many things in, in his book. He wrote about the war, principle of the war, what are the strategy of war. In it also he wrote about education, who should be a teacher, what is teacher education, what should, who is a Muslim student. So many things others also did. Jazakallah khair and, and, and the rest of them. I want to make a little contribution. You talk about Borno and their method of memorization, not just memorization, they also wrote the Quran. They wrote it in such a way that Borno writing became a worldwide calligraphy. Very expensive, anywhere in the world where you have Borno Quranic writing is very expensive. So Borno is unique for their calligraphy. Then about this hostel in, uh, in Egypt, I came across the writing of Professor Brian Muhammad of Islamic Studies Department. The general idea is that a hostel was built for Borno students, which is a fact. And the government sponsored their education, which was a fact, and they were given allowances and the rest of them. But Professor Muhammad said, in addition to that, there was a college within Azhar meant for West African students to teach them about Maliki Fekpo, because Egypt was, I think, Hanafi or Shafi'i. Egypt is Shafi'i. We are Maliki. 
So an institute within Azhar was established to teach our West African students about Maliki um, School of Thought. Um, Professor and Mr. Chairman, I want to register my, 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 my disappointment, my regret about the Ijtihad Journal of Triple IT. It has been killed, it has died, and many of us have benefited by gaining promotion in an institution with the writing in that Ijtihad is the Journal of Triple IT. If you can go through the past editions, you will see very, very worthy writings about Islam, but that journal is no more. It hasn't died. Then we will ask, we want you to give us an explanation as why we have not been receiving latest copies. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi. It hasn't been killed. It is in, uh, is, uh, it has fainted. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, Professor Salisu doesn't want to explain further, but there is an effort to revive it from its fainting uh, in conjunction with the Center for Islamic Civilization and Interfaith Dialogue, so that uh, the journal would be a university based journal. Uh, because some universities recognize the triple IT to say, okay, this is a, uh, an organization just like JNI or Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs or something of that nature. So some universities have uh, actually started even to reject uh, publications or articles that are due in the Al Ijtihad. And uh, despite the fact that uh, it is subjected to the highest level of peer review you can find in any university-based uh, journal. Uh, so this effort uh, is, uh, I think, uh, is uh, on. Uh, Professor Salisu is also the director of the Center for Islamic Civilization and Interfaith Dialogue. I think inshallah uh, would continue to push towards uh, that. <laughs> well, uh, actually, when, uh, what uh, Professor Awingida has stated is actually the situation. Uh, many universities now, when you are an academic staff and you present your papers for promotion, and they see that you have published a paper in an ijtihad, they will say they don't accept it, that it is not a university-based journal. But this is only happening in Nigeria. You see, because of some of the things we have stated, uh, many academics up to now have not stopped looking at uh, the triple IT as just a mere da'awa organization, a bunch of anakalahus that are intellectually lowly. Kagani? So they look at it was the, the unknown to them, the triple IT, even in America, is, a, is well respected as an academic institution. In fact, many professors from many very highly placed universities do participate as sabbatical staff in the triple IT. The triple IT undertakes and I mean, postgraduate studies, it awards masters and PhDs through its uh, inter uh, four parks institution. But up to now, because many people still think that when you start talking about Islam and economics or Islam and political science, some people still think that it is an element of intellectual weakness when you want to see political science from Islam perspective. They don't cease to be looking at this effort with disdain. Even though this particular forum, with all sense of modesty, but with some pride, isn't it? This thing we are doing now, this thing we are doing now, no department in, in biodiversity has sustained an academic forum like this one. No department has sustained or no faculty has sustained an enduring. This is the 177th presentation. Haba, ko ko shiri me ake 177. 25 years now we've been doing this. 25 years. When some of you were not even born, 
some of you that are now more than not more than we started this, but still some people have not stopped looking at this as when it's your own ability, our in the so on. So, but we have not been discouraged because if we have been discouraged, we would have stopped it a long time ago, we would have dropped it a long time ago. But you see, some of the people that are even criticizing and each had in either in the UK today, if you go and look at their papers, their, their CVs now, you would see that. Around the 1990s or the early 2000s, they had publications in al and it was with it that they were promoted to professorship. But now they turn around and say, Triple Light, we reject it. So this is it. Thank you. Thank you. But al is still there. But Allah Mustafa today is in a better position to explain. Uh, it is going to come out, inshallah, before the end of this year. We'll, we hope to re uh, release one of the editions, inshallah. Exactly. I could see Professor Nan Abdul Hamid uh, wants to make a comment. He reminds me of the book which he had written in his uh, area uh, on, in geography and uh, extracted from his knowledge of geography. Uh, and related them to verses of the Quran. It was an effort towards integration of uh, knowledge. Unfortunately, it was uh, he published it not under the triple IT, and uh, I think it must be recognized as one of those efforts towards the integration of uh, knowledge. Uh, Professor Adnan Abdul Hamid. Thank you, sir. Uh, actually, the inspiration is from uh, triple IT. Okay. Yes, sir. So. Uh, uh, the time when I was about to write the book, uh, Professor Sari Show asked me to buy one book, uh, The Cultural Atlas of Islam. He said, this, this is a very good book for you. I said, I don't have money because it was costly 2,000 Naira at that time. He said, go and buy, uh, sell your motorcycle. <laughs> so I actually, yes, you... <laughs> <laughs> so, so I bought the book from the uh, from the office. So, from when I started reading it, I discovered that it is very, very uh, uh, rich. And uh, from there, actually, I started uh, actually lifting a lot of idea, which uh, helped me in teaching geographic thought and is the uh, course that I'm currently teaching for over 10 years. So the one thing which uh, Prof. Salih Shehu uh, didn't mention is that of Louis uh, Lamiel al -Paruki. Actually, that uh, lady, the one of uh, Paruki, contributed a lot. She contributed uh, in this uh, uh, actually, uh, a collaboration of knowledge, which we should also recommend. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Madam uh, <laughs> Saeed Suleiman, former director of the Triple IT, uh, is also going to make a contribution. Thank you, sir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I want to begin by congratulating the presenter uh, for the presentation, which is very articulate, and also for documenting the efforts of Triple IT and Nigeria. He has done uh, very well in documenting what the office has been able to accomplish over a period of years. Uh, secondly, I would like to make some few contributions to the presentation. First, with regards to the literature on Islamization of knowledge, uh, which he cited in the paper, beginning with the book published in 1998. The contribution I want to make is that this is not the first work related to Islamization of knowledge uh, made in Nigeria. 
around 1983 or 84, I cannot actually recall. By then I was a student here in economics department. I graduated in 1985. So there was a conference on Islamic economics at Sokoto where the Islamization of knowledge program started in Nigeria as rightly said by, by the professor. Uh, after the conference, there was a publication, the conference proceedings, it's a book, I have it, uh, but I cannot easily find it, but I, I have it in my book, I believe. So that proceedings contain the papers that were presented during the conference. So that is, I mean, that could also be part of the uh, publication on Islamization of knowledge. I could remember at that time, some of my lecturers that attended the conference, when they returned, uh, we overheard them joking among themselves. One of them was saying, we have learned about the Islamic demand curve. <laughs> In Sokoto, they have learned about uh, what the Islamic demand curve uh, was all about at Sokoto. So that's one contribution. Uh, the other contribution that I want to make is with regards to the issue of So uh, he was saying that in 1987, another one was made, but, but that of 84, 83 or 84 came before that of it. I, uh, many were, were done up after that. <laughs> uh, I mean, the second contribution that I want to make is with regards to the issue of, uh, this issue of influence of, on literature by the, by the by made made by Al Faruqi's works. Uh, when we are writing a paper of this nature, we should have maybe just about a paragraph, at least a paragraph about the indicators of influence. How do you determine? what you could regard as an influence of a scholar on other scholars or of a writer on other writings. There could be some indicators that you use uh, in writing your paper so that some indicators are not left out or at least for the purpose of making coming up with a scope. If you cannot touch on all the indicators, you can define your scope that these are the indicators that I want to use in my paper to measure uh, the influence of a, uh, of a particular writer on other writers and so on and so forth. So the contribution that I want to make is that these indicators can include citation and also uh, references as rightly used in the paper. He used citations, he used uh, uh, references, but apart from this, there are, could be other indicators for this uh, review Somebody can write something, other people can review that work. So when you write a book or a paper and it attracts reviews from other scholars, that is also an indicating that uh, the, the reviewers are working based on the, what the past writer has written. So when a paper, an article attracts so many reviews, that article is making impact. Apart from that, there could also be rejoinders, even though rejoinders are part of reviews, but rejoinders are disagreement that you are saying that you don't agree with what somebody has written and you also write another uh, point of view about the paper. So it is also an indicator. Uh, you can also have uh, commentaries. I could remember the Triple IT office has written a book on a commentary on a paper presented by late Waziri Jinedu of Sokoto about the speech he, 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 he presented during 1972 uh, conference at ABU Zaria. So the convocation I wanted to say is a paper of maybe just half of the size of this paper, but a whole book 
is written as a commentary on every part and parcel of that paper, almost every paragraph. A paragraph or two can constitute a full fledged paper. So, a book was written as a commentary on that paper. So, commentaries on the work of other people, just like in the Islamic, uh, uh, I mean, in, 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 in Islamic studies, is very common uh, for us to come across uh, commentaries of books written by previous scholars. Munat Tafayin, Sherihin Kaza, Sherihin Bukhari, Sherihin Izia, and so on and so forth. All these uh, commentaries are uh, also indicators of impacts made by the people that wrote the original works because they have uh, inspired others to write such commentaries. So if people have also made commentaries on the work of Al Faruqi, they could be added here as part of the influences made by Al Faruqi on literature. So this is what I mean by indicators of influence. You can have many of them. Uh, so they can all be reflected in a paper or somebody is at liberty to say, my paper is limited to citations and uh, references only and so on and so forth. Because it's not easy to do a work of this nature. So sincerely speaking, the professor has done uh, a very good job. Uh, the other aspect, sorry, I said two uh, contribution. The last contribution is on the recommendations. I would like to recommend that somebody, especially among the young people around, people who are studying with the uh, with, with ICT, ICT study students. I mean, people who are very cumbersome uh, with doing research with the ICT. Uh, facilities that are around us. There is what is called indexing. Journals nowadays are being indexed by databases. If you take uh, academia.edu, for instance, is one of the organizations indexes research works. Spokers, I mean, there are, there are so many of and so on and so forth. So, somebody can undertake a study to find out the number of citations of the name Al, -Al Faruqi by scholars in Nigeria. If your scope is Nigeria, like the case of the paper written by, by our professor or even you extend it to West Africa, or even to the world in general. That study can, can easily be done by using the indexes that we have. Because even myself, I have a paper that I put in academia.com. Whenever somebody uses the paper and cites my name, they will send me an alert that somebody in Malaysia or somebody in UK or somebody in Ghana has read your paper. And I will see it. I, I, I wrote an article, Islamization of Knowledge and Integration of Knowledge, a conceptual framework. If you Google it, you will see it. They always send me I mean, uh, alerts about people that use the paper. Or somebody has written a book and he has cited the paper in the book, they will send it uh, to me. So today, these things can be done uh, in an easy way. That is a way of measuring, in fact. In fact, even the, 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 the issue of ranking best universities in the world today is done by that means. If you publish works and they are not on the internet, they are not being indexed, the world will not be aware of what you are doing. And that's why universities in, uh, in Nigeria, in Africa in general, uh, when you rank 100 universities, you will hardly uh, get one. I think even among 1,000 universities, you couldn't get one university from Nigeria, simply because Nigerian scholars are not making impact. Making impact means having academic activities like this. It's not only teaching that makes you a lecturer. No, that is not enough. But attending cons uh, conferences of this nature, making publications, we have just had the, the lamentation that the, the journal is dead. 
the journal should not be dead. It's through publication that you read the name of the university. So uh, my recommendation is that we hope somebody will make this kind of study. I, I don't know whether triple IT is still some sort of people to, to make studies. Uh, somebody can make a study to further find out other contributions or influences made by al Faruqi on in the intellectual arena. Uh, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Thank you very much for this uh, uh, input. I don't know any of our brothers, Dr. Teddy, or any person has a, a chair. Before we go to our sisters, Professor Aisha, you should be ready. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, wa sallallahu ala nabil kareem. Actually, the paper has been presented very well, and the content of the paper are quite very wet. Therefore, I appreciated the way the prof do his homework a lot. Uh, mine is only one, that uh, the triple IT is almost across the globe, as it has been existing here in BUK, if you travel, if you are interested in triple IT, ask their office. I used to do that. Uh, I have opportunity to be in different countries. And anywhere I was there, I used to associate myself with triple IT. When I was in UK, there is three offices in the UK, one in London, one in Suspect, and another one in the Lancaster. All I visited their offices. And even when you are in Malaysia, that is a home of triple IT. Almost there is no any university in Malaysia without triple IT. And almost it is more or less like a compulsory course, Islamization of knowledge in all the universities in Malaysia. Therefore, uh, I would be glad to announce to you that uh, to associate yourself with Triple IT and their contribution, you will be happy wherever you get yourself. You indicate you are part and parcel of Triple IT, you will get people, even if you want to conferences. If you see people in the conferences, not even regarding to Triple IT. If you discuss with some people, immediately you enter into Islamic activities, they will show you that they are a member of all, they are participating in the triple IT activities. And from there, you will have a special connection, not contact. Special connection, not contact. Take not my word, not contact. Because till now, I have contact with people, they forget about me. But don't we discuss about the triple IT, they're still in connection with me. So I'm proud to associate myself with Triple IT, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah to all our activities. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, sir. Do you have any? Yes, sir. A'udhu billahi min ash-shadam al-jami sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, the presenter, the triple IT. Just like the recent uh, speaker uh, and contributor, it's good to be associating yourself with the uh, triple IT. We know how much benefit we are driving. In fact, sometimes I stay at home and follow the lecture through Zoom. So it was later after they have started, then I feel it necessary that I have to be there. I have to be here. So uh, I think one last time in our meeting, I think uh, when we had collaboration with the NICEF, uh, we, we agreed that the young academics, especially us that are teaching courses at whatever levels, Maybe we need to step down all the activities of the triple IT. That despite the challenge of the secular people, we need to step down. Immediately after that meeting, one of us again in the department, you know, in our BMAS, all the courses that are taught in, uh, in education, uh, after you finish teaching any course, there the Islamic perspective on that course. Sociology of education, psychology of education, curriculum, whatever the courses are the column. And then Alhamdulillah is the fact of hard work of professor and his colleague in the department. We have this Islamic perspective on whatever course. 
So Alhamdulillah, a brother who is a colleague in the department has started changing attitudes toward that direction. And then one of the students have challenged him <laughs> in one of the lectures. While he's presenting the Islamic perspective uh, on evaluation is psychology 3201 that we have been teaching in the recent concluded second semester. So uh, the student attacked him, uh, where the Christian's uh, method of, of evaluation. Alhamdulillah, he handled the situation very well. He addressed the class, we are very much happy. So uh, we just try to, I am just trying to draw the attention of the academics. So we need to change our attitude, we need to step down all these activities, very, very fundamental. Secondly, sir, uh, I don't know. You know, there are some courses, for example, during our undergraduate levels, I, I have succeeded courses in Islamic studies, even though I did uh, BA in history. There is one course in history, that is two courses, first and second semester, I see is level, level two, that is the Muslim world. The literature, we need to integrate that knowledge. I don't know whether still the practice is there or not. But at the end of that course, when you finish that Islamic uh, Muslim world, you ended up blaming Isa, Abdullah ibn Zubair, Yazid, and other things. So, and then the reference book is, is, is not more than that, the Western Orientalist book, P.K. Haiti. Of the references where we have been given that. So you ended off the course, Muslim law, then you ended off blaming the, the, the Sahabas. So I don't know whether this introduction, uh, int uh, integration is taking effect in that. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Konko. So you just uh, uh, made me to what I've been thinking about really in the course of uh, teaching even Islamic history, I had been thinking of really this integration of knowledge. Somehow, doesn't it go into Islamic studies itself? Integration of the knowledge. We need a new reading of Islamic studies, particularly Islamic history, how it is being taught. Uh, most of the references, as you've said, uh, particularly on uh, Islamic uh, history, you find in English, mostly they are books written by Orientalists. And you end up really having a wrong perception of what the Islamic history uh, is. They pick up issues related to the book written about Dariya Dubuda, uh, the Arabian Nights, and uh, all the escapades that happened during the Arabian Nights. And they give you, this is what Islamic history is. They pick up about the differences between the companions and the wars that took place. This is what represents Islamic uh, uh, history. But take up the Islamic civilization in the way that has been propounded by uh, Abul Hassan Ali and Nadwi, for example, the book that has been translated under the auspices of Triple uh, IT, Islam and the World, or Mother Khasir al Alam bin Hidat al Muslimin. Uh, this is a book that seeks to read Islamic history in a form of the integration of knowledge that uh, is being propounded uh, as of now. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Konkoso. And uh, probably we now go to our sisters. Uh, Dr. Kabir Harun Awaisi. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. How are you? Okay, please. Uh, we we are not in, we have to finish with the brothers before we come to sisters. So please let me make you to wait and uh, let us have the sisters and uh, we will come to you. Yes, uh, uh, Professor Aisha Gerbhabib. Oh, okay. No, any of the sisters, uh, please, who wants to make a, a comment? Or before you get ready, let me go back to Dr. Kabiru then. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And the, 
mine first i would like to commend the presenter for his uh, fascinating presentation and the, for his also consistency and tireless and relentless services to scholarship and the mentoring of uh, young and upcoming scholars. And I hope one day one of his uh, mentees will take a challenge, a right about uh, his intellectual influence on young academics in Nigeria. Uh, this paper, as uh, Dr. Said said, is a wonderful documentation of history of uh, the activities of Triple IT. And to me, as a student of history, I see it as a source of history of Islamic education in 20th and 21st century Nigeria. Uh, then I have critique of the paper, a question, then I will clear an impression, which is the last thing that I will do. First, a subtle critique of the paper. The paper promises to uh, discuss the influence of, of uh, Al Faruqi on Islamic thought in the West African subregion, with particular reference to Nigeria. So when I look at the paper critically, most of the works cited and the scholars that are influenced by the thought of Al Faruqi are from Northern Nigeria. I think if there are scholars in the Southern part of Nigeria, whose thoughts and writings are influenced by al Faruqi, they should be also considered in the paper. Then there is a question, rhetorical question that uh, a paper raised. Uh, who is this al Faruqi? And this question is raised consistently by the consumers of knowledge and the readers of the literature of the Islamization of knowledge. I thought the presenter will devote even a paragraph on the intellectual biography of the Al Faruqi so that a reader can easily understand the intellectual formation and the, the influences, major influential, uh, intellectual influence, uh, influences on Al Faruqi himself. Uh, that, these are the uh, observations, or rather, uh, a critique. Then in the introduction, the presenter talk about the skepticism, which the idea of the Islamization of knowledge confronted at the nascent and early stage. So I would like to know who were the critics and the, what was the basis of the skepticism. Uh, then lastly, my friend and the HOD of uh, education made some, if I can call it a very sweeping uh, remark on the courses that is taught in the Department of History, especially the Muslim world. I don't know who taught him the course, I cannot uh, easily counter what he said, but uh, based on my knowledge from my undergraduate days to date, these course or courses, because there are two courses in the first and second semester that are taught in the department, we don't you know, approach them in a very simplistic and the lazy way. We diversify our sources and the, the literature that we consult before we teach the course. And the, I also want to clear an impression that uh, knowledge is universal. You cannot uh, easily condemn Haiti for what he wrote. Yes, you can read him critically. You can agree and disagree with him. Haiti is one of the sources that we use in teaching the course, but it's not the only uh, source that we use. We use many literature authored by Islamic uh, scholars. And the, our department is not teaching theology, it's teaching history. There is no 
any component of, if you like, you know, uh, indoctrination or sectarianism in the way we teach uh, our courses. So honestly, as this is a very wrong uh, impression. Thank you very much. Probably, I think his uh, comments uh, need some uh, listening from the presenter. Yeah. Okay, later. Okay. Uh, okay, doctor. Uh, very good. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, please by, permit me to skip the existing protocol. Let me first uh, commend the thought provoking presentation by our professor. And may Allah reward him abundantly. So I want to believe that what you did in the last 30 years, promoting triple IT project, making advocacy, outreach, and the likes, is enough to change the landscape. So long as we don't have our own university, I don't think we can make much impact. So triple IT needs to have its own university. We were opportune to go to other places like Tanzania, Sumit University, we see it. And we visited Morogoro University together with Professor Alhamdulillah. And I'm happy around, we do have a brother, Dr. Rabiu Garba, uh, and a number of brothers who were uh, studied at you know, IIUM. The secret behind blossoming of this triple IT project in Malaysia is nothing but the establishment of IIUM. We do have a number of problems when it comes to, we can be writing papers, of course, making presentations and having these journals and the likes, but the real impact, we can see it at least when we have our own independent platform, that is, which is intellectual academic, nothing more than a university. Uh, Professor cited an example of uh, problems that we face. Those who have chosen triple IT or Islamic perspective to be their area of specialization. You become demoralized to be writing on that aspect because of the impediments that you'll be confronted with when it comes to promotion. So I think, sir, forget about, I don't say, say I'm not saying that we forget about all the advocacy. But please, let's shift ground. Let's have a, another focus of making attempt and to start it now of university project by triple IT and it's possible. So that all the effort that you have been doing, the people that you have been mentoring, all that you have been doing is enough. And if you critically look at IIUM, I don't think IIUM has, you know, number of intellectual oh, they, they have it they have intellectuals of course but when you compare their effort individually with the effort that you have been doing you can't th there is no match at all so please and please take it and uh, review and consider the issue of having triple it university in Nigeria, not necessarily by its name if you can have covenant university and places like that even with one department Let's have it so that those who have interest or those who want this idea to become their area of specialization, they can join you. This is my contribution. Sir. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, all. My name is Muhammad Hamza from NDA University. So, well done, sir. What I think is that all effort of Islamization of knowledge, it used to have, it used to happen to the youth that have attained universities. My turn is that what of our, what of our younger brothers that are at, at a secondary school? 
Kuhuyo maji FFS, ufia student, you do learn well about Islamic study, Arabic, and geography, cannot go anywhere in the, in the natural system education. Today, all our younger brothers, all our parents, they don't want to admit their children in a Islamic school. So they used to admit it a Western education. Unless if that's a, it's a time or nothing doing, they may use to attach him to the what? To the uh, Quranic teach. But in, in time with the youth they have to know to Western education. So our total attention, it, it goes to the what? To the Western education. For example, yeah, how could your student, a uh, your child, be better at a uh, chemistry, better at a uh, biology, better at uh, it. If FS is reading Islamic study, Arabic, a master, you may think he has no, has no pictures. But what I think is so only is better so like worship of knowledge. It used to happen to those that are attend universities. But how much, how much of us, how many of us are you blessed to attend universities? But we have a much of our graduates, much of our brothers at his kind school. Even if FS is used to look at a chef to start to start the first student, talking the the idea of the Islamic Islamic knowledge. So we have talked our we have talked about our we have talked about business scandals and scandal school. Scandal school is what like a mission. If you have if you have any if you are in school, you also stand even to but forever I have been at a one school. Whenever I have to start a lecture or in the lesson, I also start with a four eight. Bismillah Bismillah Rahman Rahim in the winya to end my call one والله ورسوله حق يردو إن كان مؤمن ولا تفعلف إلا حتى تؤمن ملاكي. This word which I used to describe it what I at for my. So this is something that a a new things. So we have to talk that in relation must be cut down to our secondary schools. Thank you, sir. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ibrahim Umar Abere, in the Faculty of Law, Muru Musa University, Kazina. Uh, we we are all BUK for uh, on graduates postgraduate and so on and alhamdulillah we are still very close to the university the activities of the also close to it and we go through a lot of their literatures uh, somebody has just made a comment that i have put something on and that had to do with the secondary schools and maybe the primary schools a way the triple it could collaborate or do something to influence especially literatures that have been taught in these schools you'll be surprised how a lot of interests influence what our students what our children are taught in the schools uh, these are the textbooks that are recommended by the government so we should write we should start looking at how to sponsor write-ups textbooks uh, that will get also the approval of the government so that they are taught with some influence of Islamic knowledge right in the secondary schools and the primary schools. And I don't know what collaboration the Triple IT is doing, if possible, to start with Kano, uh, the secondary schools, the Islamic secondary schools, on how these ideas will be inserted in the minds the younger ones that are especially almost graduated coming to the universities so that they have an introduction of what the efforts of the triple it is before they even get themselves uh, into the universities that is very important because they will all serve as foundation uh, ground for uh, breeding those uh, islamic scholars with the perspective of islamic studies in whatever they, they learn Aslam Ali. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, my name is Sani Safiyan from the Department of Political Science at the University of Kano. Uh, uh, mine is uh, questions and seeking for clarifications. 
uh, uh, I really happy with the way Triple IT what conducting these regular discussions on different issues. But uh, we need to take our uh, self back to understand, for instance, always when I hear about somebody saying reintegrations of knowledge or Islamization of knowledge. So having come from a political background of politics, whatever I read, at the end, I will find it in an Islamic perspective there. So what are we integrating? There are any knowledge that is outside the scope of Islam? That is number one. If there is what, because we in the political science department, we go back to trace the history of the root of politics. So from the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks or inform his angel that he is going to create a man or human being and make him his bicegerent on earth. And the response he got, so from the angel, so some of our scholars, that is where they are tracing the root of politics, for instance. So is there anything outside the full view of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because my question is, when you say integrating knowledge, so which knowledge are you integrating with what? That is number one. And number two, if you say Islamization, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in the deen, in the lahi islam So right from Adam, to the last prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not recognize any deen apart from the Islam. So my question here, I'm so I'm confused. I want to know that, is there any knowledge outside the scope of Islam or is there, what are we integrating? So I want to know this clearly so that I will start building my ideas on what I supposed to do to what give my contribution in this aspect. Thank you very much. And then the new uh, concept of integration of uh, uh, knowledge itself what they actually mean by, uh, by, by this, and uh, probably then, but uh, I know Professor Salisu would uh, shed more light uh, on that. Uh, we are getting short of uh, the, the time, unless if you agree that we would add some five minutes to the one o'clock that uh, we are aiming at, we, are, we have uh, four minutes to one, and I can see uh, how many hands up there is uh, one, two. I uh, you know Dr. Salahuddin Baba Dini wanted to add uh, one more thing. Okay, let's, uh, let's have it. No? Yes, yes. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I would like to extend my appreciation to all my lecturers uh, that are on the high table. <laughs> uh, mine, actually, to my thinking, we have been agitating for Islamization of knowledge for almost 25 to 30 years in this university. And uh, I could really understand that many of us here are now ambassadors ambassadors of this project, directly or indirectly, we are Muslims. And uh, obviously we know the root of uh, knowledge is Islam. As uh, what Dr. Sani has uh, pointed out, not only in political science, but also in my area in guidance and counseling, I always trace the genesis of guidance and counseling started from that uh, period because the word is even a divine word. Yes, who done? So, Sir, I know there are a lot of efforts, and uh, there were also efforts put uh, back in uh, this project, but uh, from the way now the world is moving, actually we cannot always say that we will centralize our activities in one place. Uh, let us always try to collaborate with other departments 
and with other faculties, not only faculty of uh, physical sciences, so that we can be able to be integrating ourselves even into their individual programs like uh, workshops, like uh, seminars, like uh, conferences, so that triple IT will be everywhere in the university. And also even the lectures, these monthly lectures, I think we have been doing this for quite a long time here in all campus. We can start thinking of going to faculty of education, going to center for Quranic studies. Of course, we have an accommodation there so that we can be able to actually mobilize many people. My main work is to give orientation in life. That's why I'm a professor in guidance and counseling and in education, to orient people. So since here we are very much aware of the triple IT, the impact of triple IT, not to even have on our university, but let us even now have our faculties so that they can have sense of belongings. I am telling you, I am sure, those of us that are in our departments, when you talk of Islamization of knowledge, people think that we are only Professor Salisiehu, Hame uh, Ilyasu, and Konkosu. Uh, they are the ones that are now in Islamization of knowledge. They will even start uh, trying to think that it is something that even they are not part of it. Not knowing that majority of the lecturers are Muslims and we are all ambassadors. Not only ambassadors, but also bystanders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are duty bound due to the knowledge Allah has bestowed on us to always project the image of Islam wherever we are, whatever we are teaching. Of course, we, it's just because of lack of understanding and perception, we cannot transform any topic, any topic we are teaching, you can actually bring in Islamic context in that subject. I'm sure Dr. Malam Babangida, when I was a student of Islamic studies in, uh, in, 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 at, at my undergraduate uh, years, the way, the approach they used that then, we, if that time, Wallahi was able to understand the difference between the Orientalist claims in all our writings of Islam, whenever I listen to it, anybody who is making tafsir or a teacher citing references, I will try to understand whether this is Orientalist view or this is real Islamic point of view that someone is saying. You see, because of their orientation, because of their lectures, we were taught even the Orientalist literature at that time. And most of the claims, most of the hadiths, and most of so many things that we think they are really Islam, while well, they are not Islam. So thank you very much. We have to expand the scope, sir. We can now actually open up and move to all other faculties, whole lectures, integrating conferences, uh, workshops, seminars, departmental seminars. Let us bring someone as our ambassador there to present a paper which has a relationship with the project of Triple IT of actually orienting people to understand their religion and to understand how they can now sell their religion to others so that people could benefit. I'm sure those people that work and we get the religion, they did it as what Taranan, some were Taranan scholars. We were taught they moved from North Africa to even Kanem Borno and from Kanem Borno to even here, Hausa destination. They are just bringing the products and at the same time along with the religion. So it means we have to move to other people. We cannot just stay in just one place and say that, okay, everybody will understand us. So thank you very much. My name is Dr. Yaw Ahmad Sarah from School of Continuing Education, Bayer University, Kano here. So about, uh, I just want to talk about two issues. One, I, although I, I, I am a student of educational psychology, I also have background in history. And I want to concur with the, what the doctor has suggested. I look at the paper and uh, I think it will be very important, strongly important that uh, the, our mentor, I am a good, uh, I'm a disciple of Professor Salis Shew, but I think it is important that he adds in the paper, who is this Al Baruki? Maybe we are here, the paper, the the, the of the paper just say the influence of Al Baruki on Islamic thought, but it shall have been the influence of Ismail Raji Al Baruki on Islamic thought in the West African sub-region, so that people will know the al Faruqi we are talking about. Secondly, sometimes we went for conferences, 
and the people will be asking, please, do you have papers of Professor Salis Shehu? Sometimes we Google with our Lord, we distribute to people, even non-Muslims that are there. And some of them do go and conduct some researches about all these things. And uh, I think the life of Al Faruqi is very vast, from his past to his teachings in several universities, from Al Azhar to Pakistan to American universities to Canada, and to the time he was brutally murdered in his home in Palestine. All these things will really help. Secondly, I want to also uh, suggest that uh, uh, some people uh, in, in those years, there is a book that Al-Faruqi wrote in 1962. The title of the book is On Arabism. On Arabism. And uh, on the, the people, the, those people that read those books, they were thinking that Al-Faruqi is ordinary, a, 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 a tribal a chauvinist. It, it says, it, that, that is uh, moving the course of Arabism only during that time. Not knowing that at a time during Al Faruqi's life, life, he introduced all these Islamic, uh, is, uh, Islamic thought we are talking about. So we can go back and uh, maybe disassuade the people's mind from what, what, uh, what, what they are thinking about. We are living in an intellectual era and some of us and so many people will go and conduct so many researches on this, on, on his person. Lastly, sir, uh, we in the triple IT, uh, sometimes we look at these people from only the thought. But I think Al Faruqi also influences people like Anwar Ibrahim of uh, Malaysia, who was sometimes deputy, although very controversial person, but who was sometimes deputy, by, deputy vice chancellor and uh, who is considered as Islamist to the core. And I think when we get ourselves in the corridor of power, we also utilize the knowledge, this thought that we are talking about always to see that we bring changes. Just like what Professor Salisio has done in Bochy State, with his, the few years he was in the corridor of power, he introduced education for women, suggested that schools for married women should be built and financed by government in all the emirates, and they are still existing was what uh, Dr. Galladen, she did when he was in the Sangaya uh, here in Kano. So when we find ourselves in the corridor of power, we also try to act to practicalize this thought we are talking about. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, for coming back. I just want to appeal that our brother here, who talked about using Haiti for teaching history up to this period, should be properly understood. He's throwing the challenge to the Muslims that we should produce our own history written by Muslims from the perspective of, the, of Islam. Let me tell you, the most authoritative book being used in history on Sokoto Halifit now is more last. Sokoto Halifit, am I wrong? More last is full of distortion about Sokoto Jihad. Full of distortion. He actually distorted the history of Sokoto Halifit rather than writing about it. Let me give you one. He said the jihadist fought over booty. It's a lie. It never happened. Because before they go for the war, the names of those present will be registered. Where they come from will be written down. So after the war, the booty will be collected. Everybody has gone back. But when they have their businesses, as soon as the war is over, they go back. The Gabayaneza Araba say, Aayka Kowa Nashi. So how can he say that the jihadists were fighting over booty? It's a lie. It's a blunt lie. Number two, Chewa, I've forgotten the town. When they entered the town, some army of the jihad misbehaved. They misbehaved. They were taking things, they were destroying things, and the rest of them. That was what Abdullah ibn Fudu decided. 
to leave the world and come and immigrate because he was so frustrated that how can people be doing this? There are about 70 battles fought by the jihadists. 70. Only one episode, only one episode witnessed this unfortunate incident. So how can you say that the jihadists are, are, are not disciplined? How can you say that? Only one. And what happened was that the jihad was becoming very popular. Say, embandit, sukashugo, chicken jihadi, sengang anasamu. And that was why they misbehaved during the last episode. And they never did it again. And it only happened only once. These are the lies more than last. Your, your, your primary source. These are the kind of lies he's propagating in the Sokoto Halifit. Salam alaikum. Thank you very much. Uh, please, I want to seek your indulgence. Just for something, I would want, please, those amongst us who are lecturers in any university, college of education, polytechnic, anywhere, please uh, stand up to be recognized for prayers anywhere in higher institution, all of us including the lecturer, the presenter. <laughs> I want all of us who are teaching in any higher institution to stand up to be recognized. How, oh, Salahuddin of course is standing. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, sorry, you are still, you are still a lecturer. <laughs> uh, we constitute here, do we constitute third of one third of no. Hmm? Well, that is appreciable. You, may Allah bless all of those who are standing and those who are sitting down. You can sit down. <laughs> yes. Uh, I was just trying, amongst those who have stood up, uh, very few uh, senior professors one or two, Professor Salichiau, Professor. Uh, in the UK, you have not less than 500 professors and who are Muslims. I, 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 I am thinking that probably uh, the strategy of uh, triple IT reaching out uh, has also to be revised so that uh, apart from catching our brothers and sisters who are at the undergraduate and even postgraduate level, we need really to involve more those of our senior academics, people who are here in BUK, and probably you find that they have never attended any of these 177 uh, group discussions and workshops that the triple IT has held. Uh, this is uh, this is worth noting. Uh, probably I know also previously uh, some of the programs, specifically Triple IT has uh, uh, directed postgraduate uh, students and uh, lecturers in institutions of higher learning. But I think really we need to reach up to those of our senior academics uh, in Bayer University and other surrounding universities so as really to make them understand this whole concept and also for them to start implementing them in their own areas of uh, their disciplines. Uh, finally, uh, we come back to the paper presenter. Uh, for responses to the various uh, comments, questions that were raised. So, in the chair, my attention, you are in touch. Come on, Omar Nini. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with all sense of humility, I appreciate the comments and the criticisms and the questions that have been made. I have. Uh, uh, received a number of comments and criticisms that uh, I pray I can sit down and use them to improve the paper. This is uh, the benefit of making presentations. I cannot comment on all the comments that have been made, but I will try to answer the questions that have been raised. But I will not 
forget to appreciate the comments and contribution made by Malam Saeed Suleiman when he identified about five or six things that can be considered to be indicators of influence, which the paper should have clearly uh, identified. Uh, perhaps we can say, what do you, uh, what, what I mean, operational definition of what influence actually is. I have noted this, uh, and I think, uh, inshallah, I will get them integrated into the something. Thank you so much. About the comments that have been raised by the issue of the course in the Department of History, the Muslim world, I think a lot of interventions have been made on that. Uh, you see, it started all from the fact that these formal institutions that we have and the curriculum that are being used there is brought by the West. And these things, these courses are taught in English or in European languages. And it so happens that the, the students cannot have any reference ready unless the reference is made, I mean, written by uh, Orientalists. That is how it began. The failure is that Muslim scholars or Muslim intellectuals here have failed to write their own version of those reference materials. That is why we continue to rely upon uh, the writings of Philip Hitti, Marelas, and other things. Maybe what I would want to also mention to uh, Malin Salahuddin is that we don't only rely on the writings of Marelas on Sakata Caliphate, but up to date, Professor Marelas is still alive and he's almost around 90 years old. But believe you me, we, he is so much celebrated and respected to the extent that if there is anything, if there is any conference on Sokoto Caliphate of international appeal that will be organized today, the organizers would necessarily invite Marelas to come. This is the way he is respected on issue of Sokoto Caliphate. When the bicentenary conference was being organized, that is the conference that was being organized in 2004, 2005, to celebrate the 200 years of Sokoto Caliphate, Marelas was invited and he was considered as the most authoritative scholar on Sokoto Caliphate, essentially because we don't work. Not only Sokoto, not only Marelas, Dr. Salahuddin would remember that to date, the most respected authority on Nana Asamao is Jim Boyd. She's American. They, 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 they cherish knowledge, they respect it, and they spend a lot on research. Do you know how Jim Boyd became an authority on, on, on Nana Asamau? When Jim Boyd was undertaking research on Nana Asamau, she came to Sokoto. Uh, she spent all her years researching on Nana Asamao. I mean, these are the reasons. Again, I, I believe Dr. Kabiru Isa would know this. I have been saying it. No professor of Islamic studies, Malam Babangida, and no professor of history, no Muslim professor of history had written a book similar to the one written by that Igbo professor in, 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 in NDA, Islam in African History. The, the, the most comprehensive book on the role of Islam in African history was written by an Igbo man. Yes, PN Uber, CN Uber. No Muslim professor in Nigeria, in, in Gairo or in Sumatra Fodio has written on the influence of Islam or the role of Islam in African history as Uba has written. We are not doing it. That is what we'll continue to rely on others. This is the, this is the simple explanation. Now, on the issue of uh, the comments made by Dr. Kabiru Isa, I've noted them. I appreciate the fact that there is a scanty reference to intellectuals and writers in, from Southern Nigeria, of course, 
I was only mentioning Dr. Uh, Professor Adebayo, the only thing. We will walk further to get more from that uh, axis, inshallah. Uh, before Dr. Kabiri Isa came, and I think somebody also raised that issue about who is this Al Faruqi. Before you came, I made an explanation to that. I said that this paper was written five years ago, originally for presentation in India on an international conference on the life and times of Al Faruqi. And that the, the, even the concept not contain a biography of Al Faruqi. So when I was writing the paper, I felt it, for that audience, it may not be necessary to keep on repeating the life and times of Faruqi. But when I was coming here, I felt it was necessary. So I reviewed the paper and the one, the copy I have now, unfortunately, I couldn't do it before it was distributed. But the copy of those of us that have here in the, on the high table contains three pages dedicated to the life and times of Al Faruqi. I promise I will hand, it, hand my copy to you. Yes. Who are those skeptics on uh, Islamization of knowledge? Those who express rejection or skepticism or doubt or reservations or misgivings about Islamization of knowledge can be classified into about three or four. There are those that are really well grounded in Western philosophy and seriously influenced in Western philosophy that they see any attempt to think differently from that, you know, is a, what, what do I call it? It's not just a rebellion against a dominant international tradition, but they think it is not knowledge at all. I mean, they, has, they are so brainwashed by Western thought and Western worldview that to think differently, they, may, they think that that is not knowledge. So when you come to talk in a way that, I mean, different from Western worldview and Western philosophy, they don't see that as knowledge. And because they have so been in, intoxicated by Western uh, uh, intellectualism and Western uh, philosophy. That is one. The second skeptics, and I'm sorry to say, are people that are not well-read. I'm sorry to say that. But if you are not well-read, I mean, if you are well-read, you will have no problem about the concept of, you know, Islamization of knowledge, because you know, you know, and I believe uh, these are arguments we've been doing with Smala and Sayyidu Suleiman in the beginning of triple IT. You know that what we argue is that knowledge per se, knowledge per se is value free and is neutral. But knowledge per se has never existed because knowledge has always existed within social historical context. And to the extent that knowledge always exists within social historical context, as Wazir Junaid argues, it has a commitment to the worldview of that context. And to that extent, the knowledge that is being transmitted cannot be neutral, cannot be value free. And therefore, there is every reason to talk about Islamization knowledge. When you take the knowledge of economics, economics, for example, what is being handed over to us as knowledge of economy is rooted in the whole idea of interest. And this is what is being taught. When you talk about the concept of power in political science, the definition of power from, the, from a purely a materialist, Hobbesian, human perspective is just, you know, knowledge in the mundane and temporal sense. Because at initial, as far as enlightenment project is concerned, as far as the enlightenment project is concerned, God is a myth, is not a reality. So you don't talk about knowledge with, I mean, power with reference to God, because as far as the materialist worldview is concerned, God doesn't exist. So power belongs to the people. The whole idea of Western liberal democracy is that the, the people are the source of power. And power begins and ends from the people. And that is all. No reference is made to God. So you can see there is every reason why Islamization knowledge is nothing. But this knowledge that is being handed over to us, how do you recast it and how do you reorient it to make it conform to your own worldview as a Muslim? Because the way it is being put across to you is diametrically opposed 
to your own idea of Tawhidi epistemology. This, as I keep on repeating, is what Boko Haram fails to understand. Boko Haram is advocating that since there are some things that are anti-Tawhid in the knowledge, you throw everything away. But we say, no, you filter it. That is Islamization of knowledge. You filter it. Things that are un-Islamic, you throw them away. And you now integrate the Tawhidi concept. For example, in, in basic science, we teach people about germination. We teach students in basic biology about photosynthesis. What are the factors of photosynthesis in, 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 in basic biology? What are the factors of photosynthesis? That when these factors arrive, I mean, are put together, photosynthesis would, would happen. In biology, nobody will tell you that ultimately and absolutely, it depends on the will of Allah. But in drug life, when you are taught about water cycle, nobody will tell you that when the factors get together, they will just tell you rain will happen. Nobody will bring Tawheed into it. Integration of knowledge or Islamization of knowledge is about making knowledge to conform to Tawheed and to the Islamic worldview. I think I'm not given another lecture. I will stop at this point. <laughs> Uh, and uh, like uh, Dr. B B Professor Mabangira was saying, I think to, 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 to clear our doubts, there is the need to get some of the books and papers written on Islamization and read them carefully and try to, to understand the arguments. You will, by the end of it, you will see that all your doubts and your uh, you know, reservations may be cleared. Uh, I don't know whether Dr. Sanusi is going to join the triple IT when we were making efforts to set up a university. We took several years. Since when uh, Manas Idris Lehman was with the triple IT, we made several efforts about, uh, in the first instance, we were thinking about establishing a research institute. That was what we were making effort to do. But then because of the dearth of resources, and especially when now you look at the 14 conditions for setting up a university, uh, they are seemingly unsurmountable by us. For example, when you talk about getting 100 hectares of a piece of land as one condition, or you have, for example, 200 million cash in the bank and some other conditions, these are conditions that are really difficult, but we have not abandoned it. We still have it in mind, but the conditions to fulfill are really very difficult. In fact, at the time, we were thinking that the university should be named Al Faruqi University. Later, we thought it was better to name it Abdullah ibn Fodio University, or so on and so forth. So we have it in mind. Thank you so much. About the need to trickle down to secondary schools, I think these are things that we have been doing. Uh, we have tried to produce textbooks and reading materials that are relevant in secondary school and primary schools. We have been working on producing a curriculum, and I, I think we did some. We were working with, uh, we, uh, we've been working with AMIS, Association of Modern Islamic Schools, to see that some of the books we wrote and published, and some of the curriculum are uh, introduced to some of the secondary schools. The issue, I mean, the, the challenge is really very monumental, and uh, the resources that are required are very, very tremendous. But we have not been discouraged, neither have we, we been demoralized. We think that the little we do, the seed we may sow, it may grow sometimes. And when people, when Allah brings the people that can continue, it will continue. We are not discouraged, but we are making a lot of efforts. Uh, actually, uh, the comments made by Professor Ahmed Ilyasu on collaborations. Right from the beginning, the triple IT has always worked on the basis of collaboration. You see, in 2004, 2005, the triple IT collaborated with the Faculty of Education to organize an international conference on Muslim educational reform. And a book has been published by the triple IT. The book was co-authored, I mean, was edited by 
Professor Mansur Malufashi, who was then the Dean of the Faculty of Education, my humble self, and I think the third person is, uh, is it Professor Mehoda Ohu. Third, uh, three editors. We've always proceeded on collaboration. We have jointly organized a number of activities. Even about two weeks ago, we were in the, in the, in the Suleyem University, I mean, Suleyem Sule University, collaborating with the Department of Economics. We were in the uh, Kano State Polytechnic collaborating with the Department of Mass Communication. We are now going to release a book very shortly, maybe in the next two weeks. It's a product of collaboration between the Triple IT and the Department of Mass Communication. The title of the book is Communication in the Quran. We have always collaborated and now we have signed MOUs with a number of universities. We have signed MOU with the University of Meduguri. We have signed MOU with um, Federal University, Duse. We, have, we are now going to sign MOU with Yusuf Metamasula University. We have signed MOU with Center for Islamic Civilization and Interfaith Dialogue. We're into collaboration. But you see, but then I would want to uh, respond to the suggestion you made. You see, when we are hosting, when we are hosting this uh, group discussion in this place, it's not that we are only collaborating with Faculty of Science. No. You see, before we moved to this place, we were doing it in the former Faculty of Law. Uh, F204 in the former faculty of law. The issue is that you just need to have a base. You just, and you know what? Wallahi imukasawana even a new side, wallahi bada ajiba. People will not go. Honestly speaking, you will always have a handful of people from new side, one and the second new side, but people would not like to travel to, to, to new side to attend. So you need some, uh, some, some center where people can, uh, can easily come. And maybe combining it with uh, Professor Babangida's comment on the need to, for Triple IT to change its strategies. You see, what we're doing is that whenever we are conducting this monthly conference, before, before, and up to now, and I think Professor Suleiman Sai would, would bear me out, in all the higher institutions in, 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 in Kano Metropolis, in all of them, we identified persons whom we used to send. For example, in FCE, we may send about 10 copies to Professor Laudin. He will distribute all, I mean, to some people. Cast the same thing. Uh, Kumbozo, the same thing. Legal, the same thing. And then here in the university, across all the departments, there used to be people with whom we send. At a time, when, whenever we send, we may distribute 200 copies of a paper to be presented. But at the end, you may hardly find 20 people out of 200 that will come and attend. But we did not become discouraged. We kept on up to this moment. And whenever a presentation is made, for example, if a presentation is going to be made on, uh, on geography, Professor Adnan knows when Ali Usani Subaru was going to give a lecture last time on geography, we made sure that all the HODs of departments of geography in all higher institutions in Kano were invited. And then we invited all the lecturers in the Department of Geography to attend. So if somebody is making a presentation on economics, we make sure, for example, the collaboration we did with, Sulelami, uh, with uh, Yusuf Metamasuli on economics, we make sure all the heads of departments of economics, not only in higher institutions in Kano Metropolis, but from Kano, Jigawa, and Kazana, all heads of departments from economics uh, de department were invited. But all the lecturers in, in Yusuf Metamasule in economics department were all invited. We diversified. But do you know what? People are not forthcoming. I'm telling you, this is the simple thing. People are not forthcoming. Wallahi tallahi inda mumbina mutane wallahi da mundena wana abin tuntuni. Billahi lazi la ilaha illahu. We would always yanzu wannan abin. How many how many copies have you distributed? We we said since people we will send to them sometimes one week before. Why we do that is because we want you to have the paper few days to the time so that you will read and digest. But at the end of it you will hardly gain what over 10 of the people that you invite. So we had to stop distributing it. We say, let us leave the papers here. 
whoever comes, let him have the paper. Because the situation is that you will distribute the paper across higher institutions. You would only come here with a handful of the papers, maybe 10. But then all the people to whom you, you, you send the papers, they will not come. And the people that come here, they will not have the papers. So we say, okay, let us stop distributing them. Let us keep them here so that whoever comes, at least you can see those that came early, all of them have the paper rather than what we were doing. So Alhamdulillah, this year we've been making a lot of efforts at collaboration and so on and so forth. You see, we have to invite people to come and people who know Chewaga in the AKE regularly is easier if it is identified. But if we go to the new side, we will kill it. I'm telling you, if we go to the new side, it will be killed. Brother Azoba. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I have exhausted all the issues. Thank you so much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi May Allah reward you most abundantly. May Allah give you more faith and hikmah. Okay. Okay. Mm, okay. Okay. Uh, there are some papers of uh, Al Farugi, and uh, which would be available at the Triple IT office. We have uh, two copies of you only here. But uh, for anyone who wants, he goes to the Triple IT office. Inshallah, it will be available. Uh, I think now I hand us over to the MC Al Mustafa for final closing. Alhamdulillah, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this uh, very intellectually stimulating discussion. All I'm required to do now is to invite uh, a brother to give us the closing prayer. But before then, on behalf of uh, Dr. Seyedu Dukawa, who is the Director of Finance and Administration, who is the convener of this uh, uh, seminar for this month, I'm required to, uh, he is unavoidably absent, but I'm required to say a word of thanks to everybody. I wish to thank everybody, everybody who spared the time to come here today. May Allah reward all of you and me, we all benefit from what we have learned. And uh, in particular, of course, I'm, uh, by protocol, I'm supposed to thank the chairman himself, Professor Muhammad Babangida Muhammad, in particular, for this onerous task he has done. As the speaker, Professor Salis Shehu, who is also director of CICIT, for his uh, wonderful paper. And um, Malam Saidu Suleiman, who is up there. Uh, Dr. Salahuddin Yusuf, Dr. Jamilu Mustafa Chedi. Uh, there are also uh, many of our teachers here from the university uh, who have been recognized by the chairman. He asked all of them to stand up and he acknowledged them. So given the time for the prayers, I, I may not call their individual names, but I wish to thank all of them and for their, particularly many of them made contributions. And we also wish to thank, uh, there's a large uh, group of people who are on Zoom right now, have been following the presentations online, making comments, we wish to thank all of them, we wish to ask them to persevere and uh, hopefully, uh, for many who give their emails, I think maybe the Secretariat may email the link uh, so that they can share these discussions and reflect further on the many challenges thrown. Uh, on my part, before I call for the prayers, I just want to, with the, uh, with the approval of the chairman, just say a word about this, um, the challenge being thrown to all of us by this Islamization of knowledge, I mean, the integration. All I wanted to say is, uh, Many of us now in our research at master's PhD levels, we should try as much as possible, perhaps uh, do a papers or later after our postgraduate, do papers on this area in our disciplines. That's very important. A lot of people are doing it. Uh, they, for example, they, in the area of history, which was under discussion, I was at Ariawa House yesterday and the director of Ariawa House, Dr. Shaib, is collaborating with uh, Professor Al Qasim Abba to write a new book on history of Nigeria. They have gone far, I think, because during a recent seminar at Mambaya House, Dr. al Qasim Abba even told us why the colonial masters refused to create a country called Northern Nigeria. It's a separate country. It was deliberate. So when they bring out these things from their researches in books, 
we are more enlightened, we have more, we have better discussions in the country and our education system, which is supposed to produce intellectuals who will serve the society, should the intellectual, the education system should not be producing people who just do theoretical research that has no impact on the lives of people. We should have education like Junaid Wazir Junaid said, that should be positive and improving our lives. So Alhamdulillah, may I invite uh, Professor Salahuddin Yusuf the Baba Dini of Triple IT to give us a closing prayer. Thank you very much. Salu ala Nabi al Karim. Just take fire go mashaka. Halala go mashaka. Subhana rabbika rabbal izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursin. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.